I do need a water too. Yeah. We'll see. I hate to even ask. Oh, is she getting ready to present? Are we start. Oh. Do we have a quorum? Four? Yeah. All right, let's get started. Um, call to order the Historic Preservation Board meeting for November 3rd, 2021. Roll call, Diane. Jim Chard. Here. Robert Ostinoff, absent. Elise Lindstrom, absent. Rhonda Saxton, absent. Buddy Willis, here. Kristen Finn, here. Benjamin Baffer, here. Are there any changes to the agenda? No. Are there any minutes? No, sir. Sorry, we still we still actually need the approval of the agenda before you move on. Is there a motion you didn't get a motion. second over the agenda to approve the agenda. Thank you. Motion to approve. Second. Call the roll. Jim Charn. Yes. Buddy Willis. Yes. Kristen Finn. Yes. Benjamin Baff. Yes. <clears throat> There are no minutes? No, sir. Swear, swear in the public? Swear in the public. If, if anybody plans to speak um, tonight, if you could stand up and she'll swear you in. Estimate the notary of the state of Florida. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give us the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank I you. do. Hey, are there any comments from the public not related to quasi judicial items on the agenda? Seeing none of presentations. We have no presentations, I'm sorry. All right, no presentations. So we will move right into the quasi-judicial hearing items. Now we'll read the quasi-judicial hearing rules. This hearing shall be conducted in accordance with the City of Delray Beach quasi-judicial rules. The applicant and the city shall be permitted to present their case. The public shall be allowed to speak for three minutes each or a maximum of six minutes if the person represents an organization or a group of people who are present but agree not to speak. The city commission, board members, staff, and the applicant may be allowed to cross-examine a witness. The city or the applicant will be allowed to offer rebuttal testimony. The decision to approve or deny an application or appeal may not legally be made upon personal views as to whether a project is a good project or not, nor may a decision be based on the numbers of citizens who support or oppose a particular project. Law requires that all decisions must be made on the basis of whether the project meets the requirements of law, the comprehensive plan, and the land development regulations. Okay, the first item in the agenda is item 8A for 201 Northeast 5th Court, COA number 2021-267. I'd like to enter that file into the record. And I'd also like to note that the applicant is not here yet. He's on his way. So. Okay. I don't know, what would you suggest we do? Did he say how long he's gonna be? Katharina, are you here? She's out there. One moment. Minutes. 
given a public presentation. Stall. I think you only would have gotten three. Three. <laughs> didn't say how long can we switch the order it, it, it's up to the board's discretion if I mean if he's on his way um, you guys can make a motion to move it down to the bottom of the agenda um, typically if, if he does not come to present his case though then it would just be no action on that item so um, we need a motion yeah uh, I move that uh, that we go to item B on the agenda, 610 Ocean Boulevard. Second. Okay. If we could just have it amended so that you, you move, you also move item sure. 8A down to the after item. I'd like to amend my motion to include moving item 8A uh, subsequent to uh, 8B. Second is amended. Do we need to call the roll on call that? Roll. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Tim Chard? Yes. Claudia Willis? Yes. Chris Tim Finn? Yes. Benjamin Baffer? Yes. Okay, the next item on the agenda is item 8B for 610 North Ocean Boulevard. This is the Fontaine Fox House. I'd like to enter COA 2021-165 into the record. The owners, Mr. and Mrs. McKinney, are here with their applicant architect agent, Mr. Roger Cope. This is a COA variance and waiver. And you're going to go ahead and present first. Yep. Um, I'm going to put you up, you go, yeah. You go. So it might have been a while since you presented, but you have keys, clicker, or this guy, forward and back. You need to talk about content. This top button. Does this? Well, you do all the time. Didn't know that. It's new. Should you wish to do that? Okay. Thank you. And name and yep. Good evening, everyone. My name is Frank McKinney. My wife and I live at 610 North Ocean Boulevard, Delray Beach. We've lived there for the last 25 years. I'm gonna give you a little overview and let Roger go into the detail. Um, you know, we've lived in Delray Beach for 31 years. Uh, we, before moving into 610 North Ocean, we lived in Villa Brigo and Bankers Row. Um, back in 1988, when they designated Bankers Row, even before they designated Bankers Row, we um, bought three of the little bungalows before they even protected and uh, restored those and they're still standing today. I love that street so much that we rallied our neighbors at the time <clears throat> to uh, assess ourselves on, our on the tax rolls so that we could put in the brick pavers and the street lights and the little landscape nodes that weren't there. And then we bought Villa Brigo, an Ogren house that was done right about the time Old School Square was done in 1928. Uh, and we were going to restore that and sell it, but I kind of bought my own hype and loved it so much that I carried my wife across the threshold there in 1990 when we got married. Um, we lived there for a couple years. Matter of fact, it's funny, we, we bought that house for $75,000. And now I see it's listed for $2, $2 million. Um, so, you know. For those of you who know what I do for a living, you know, most people think it's just these big oceanfront mansions, but we got our start in Delray Beach uh, on Bankers Row. We also owned the Sandaway House Nature Center before it was a nature center, and it was zoned for five condominiums, and we chose to sell it to the county instead of develop it so they could turn it into a nature center. Um, 
We also own the historic executive suites of Del Rey that are no longer there. I remember coming to Pat Casey way back and asking her to designate those, and they never were designated, and they got, they got demolished. 622 North Ocean Boulevard is another Volk house, not on the registry, I don't think. It's not protected. Uh, we own that and could have torn it down, didn't, renovated it, and sold it about 12 years ago. 501 South Ocean Boulevard, right next to the Seagate, another house that I don't think is protected. What, that was our first oceanfront home back in 1992 that we did for a project. Could have torn it down, we didn't, restored it, and it's, it's, you know, it's beautiful today. So we're, well, well it's been a while, um, we cut our teeth on preservation, and we're very pro-preservation. We've, as I said, we've lived in our house um, since 1997, uh, and we love it. It's, um, I might build big, beautiful houses on the ocean, but I don't live that lifestyle. I love the lifestyle that we live at the Fontaine Fox house. We raised our daughter there. Matter of fact, we brought her home there. And, uh, you know, we all know that Delray Beach is this artist colony and great writer's colony. And one thing that we just love, this little heirloom and artifact, is this Tunerville trolley book that has been passed down from Fox himself to the Mott's Apple Juice people, I call them. That was the second owner. And then the Wilsons, who we bought the house from in 1997. So it's true that the creativity and ingenuity that permeates that house is, uh, is palpable. I had, I'm an author. I've written seven books now, and I hadn't written a book until we bought that house. And I've written seven books in six different genres from that house. Uh, so I'm going to let Roger get into the, the detail, but we have, we, have, we have basically three pods that we're looking to, to modify. One is taking the garage from a two-car garage to a three-car garage. Um, in 1935, it was a one-car. We think it wasn't in the same location it is now. In the 70s, it was converted to a two-car garage. And then uh, you know, we're, we're looking to add another bay to the garage. That's, that's kind of pod number one. Pod number two is, is the master bedroom. Um, it's when we found the original plans, Roger found the original plans at Palm Beach County, Palm Beach County Courthouse, um, it looked on there, even though it was designated a bedroom, that it was more like a, an attic. Because if you were laying in bed, if one of us has a bad dream, you wake up and you're gonna knock your head on the ceiling. I mean, the ceilings are really, really low. And it's quite small. Uh, I, you know, I, I walked Jim into my closet today and showed him how small it is, so we're looking to make a little bit bigger closet, a little bit bigger master bedroom. Um, but keeping, and you'll see in the elevations and in the renderings that we have blown up for you, keeping what we believe to be true that when Fox decided to hire John Volk, he wanted to pay tribute to the Tunerville trolley, the wooden trolley that made him his fortune. And he, he asked Volk to design a house for him that paid homage to this little wooden trolley. And I, we have pages dog-eared that show elevations on this little trolley that look exactly like that front elevation of the house. And so we, we're keeping that exact elevation as it is. Uh, pod number three, or, or uh, project number three, is my house is basically a one-bedroom house in the main house. Um, in, in 2013, we got a COA to connect one of the cottages to the main house so that my daughter, my daughter was living in a nursery until she was 13, a tiny, tiny little nursery. And so we connected those better, that, the, the guest house to the main house with this living room and that added this <laughs> other bedroom. So I have 17 nieces and nephews. Uh, they're visiting all the time. My daughter will soon get married and I'm sure she'll have her own kids. So we're, we're looking to add some guest bedrooms above the current guest wing, the guest uh, guest house. There's a, there's a detached guest house now. So on July 6th of 2020, I hired Roger because of his reputation for historic design. I didn't hire an architect that was going to come and slash and burn. This is what Roger's known for, sensitivity to what we have there. And over the last, what is that, 16 months, we've had eight meetings with staff listening to their feedback. Matter of fact, we were on the agenda in September, and I pulled that from the agenda based upon 
the staff report based upon me you know reading between the lines that we needed to adjust some things in that in the design so we went back to the drawing board we pulled the guest house away from the garage put it in the back of the property we modified the master bedroom balcony again um, met with all of our neighbors to make sure they were happy with it two of those neighbors who wrote letters to you are in this district that support these renovations so I got I've got north no I have I have west south and east I don't have north they're not in town that, that support the project so you know I, um, I I just think after 25 years other than what we did in 2013 which was connect the the guest house to the main house and then in 2010 we got a COA for the for the tree house which has been a you know a sore subject for some people here including me it wasn't a lot of fun going through all that many years ago we have a COA for that we haven't changed anything but a light bulb in that place and it's time you know it's time we've had four owners in 80 86 years and that house how, how much longer we're going to be there I, I don't know but to to do what we're proposing to do to it so that the next generation and the next owners can enjoy it for the next 86 years I think it it, it, it contributes to the longevity of that house and, and keeping a house up on the ocean isn't easy even though this is all cypress and the wood the original wood on the side of the house is nearly petrified it's been you know that close to the ocean with that much salt air to it it's, you can't get a nail through it you know so we're um, I, I think we've been extremely sensitive to the LDRs and to the Secretary of Interior standards when it comes to the design we've, approach we've taken. Um, that house isn't going to just sit there the way it is for the rest of its life. It just won't. We feel we're probably the best people with Roger to come in and bring it in to the next, you know, 85 years. So I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything before I turn it over to you, Roger. How do I scroll down on this? So this, by the way, so this is Fox's book. This is my seventh book that just came out this week. I wrote this from my treehouse. It's, it's a beautifully, uh, oh, I see, okay, creative place. All right, I'm just going to go through here. In the staff report, there was a reference to the house uh, just north of this one at 622 South Ocean Boulevard. I mentioned that we own that and restored that. Interesting. Other tidbit, 45 cents per square foot is what this house was built for. For those of you who are into st statistics, uh, the cost of new construction on the ocean is pushing $600 a square foot. One of the things that Roger's going to talk about is this, this, um, this variant. So in, in 2013, when we subdivided the property, uh, we received a variance to put the property, the to, to put the property line within one foot of, of the house as it sets today. And when we subdivided it, we created a buffer to the north so that from the street, the appearance of, of 12 feet, 12 foot setback for our property and 12 foot for the property to the north, you, you can, it doesn't look like it's sitting on the property line. So, so what we're asking for is not any more of a of variance than we have now, just to pull that a master bedroom a little bit further toward the east, very slightly. Um, the, the, the second floor addition to the guest wing, so in sitting with Michelle and Katerina and Michelle, I call her Michelle Jr., the other Michelle, um, they gave us some good input as to how to set off the appearance of that second floor so that if somebody were to come by in 10 years or 20 years and had a trained eye or had an untrained eye, you'd be able to tell that that addition was an addition, it wasn't original. And Roger can talk to that and how we, how we propose to do that. Uh, the paint color, you know, I mean, we can get into that. I'll, I'll let Roger do that. But basically, we've provided pictures, pictorial proof, even from the Wilsons on their wedding day 30 years ago, photographs outside the house, that the house was once whitewashed. And in our application, we asked for white paint. And then when we got these pictures, which I just got last week after I read the report that we introduced into the record, um, it's clear that the house was whitewashed. I even showed Jim some areas of the house that you can still see whitewashed today that couldn't be stripped back whenever it got stripped.
I'm almost done here. So in the staff report, it, it does state that, that it's believed that the existing cypress wood was always natural wood. And there's some, there's some quotes in there from the previous owner, Rod Wilson, saying the building portrays the materials design of an era of distinctive architectural style to wit, natural wood reflective of traditional cypress construction. We, we don't refute that. It's all natural cypress and not hardy board. It's, it's real wood, but it, it was never untreated. It was never unpainted. And I introduced into the record uh, a text string with the prior owner stating that, yes, indeed, the color in the picture is truly what the color was when they owned the house, the, this whitewashed color. I think, uh, Roger, I'll let you do the master. You can jump in. You can jump back in any so we really, really focused on this one sentence, I will tell you, in the, um, and it's hard, it's really hard to comply with in the visual compat compatibility standards. Uh, all the way down M5 on page, I can't, what page is this, honey? I'm sorry, page, excuse me, page 13. Addition shall introduce a new, ar shall not introduce a new architectural style. Okay, so we didn't do that. Mimic too closely the style of the existing building. We didn't do that. Nor replicate the original design, but shall be coherent. And that's really hard to check all those boxes. And when you see Roger's presentation and the, and the renderings that we have, we feel as though we've done that. The guest wing, um, we were provided with building cards this week. Uh, yellow cards going back to the 50s. The guest wing has been added on to no less than six or seven times based on those yellow old building cards. There used to be, I just learned this, this last week, there was three guest houses on the property and, and two of those were connected back in the 50s. So here we're proposing to add another yellow card to the stack by adding another story on top of the existing guest wing. The front door of the house back in the 30s faced south. We have that. We have evidence of that. And, and so somewhere along the line, it was moved to facing east. Um, so so we're, we're keeping the front door where it is, but we're, we're changing the, the walkway up to the front door ever so slightly. I think that's about it. I will let Roger go. Uh, at the bottom of the report, where there are your options, you know, we, we had no idea there would only be four people here tonight, which I think puts us at a bit of a disadvantage. I just want to read that into the, you know, the record. Is that there were some suggestions made, conditions made, that the garage be redesigned to honor the progression in size throughout the, the years. And we have some ideas that you'll share on how to do that. And then the guest wing, the same thing, how to make sure that if you walk up to that, you know the second floor was not original. And, and Roger will share how we propose to do that. But uh, th thank you for your time and enjoy his presentation. Jump back, jump back in any time. All right, everyone, hello. Uh, for the record, because I'm obligated to, uh, I'm Roger Cope, Cope Architects, Inc., 701 Southeast First street in the National Marina Historic District. Uh, thank you very much for having us this evening. Um, I, want, I, I don't know that they're in the room, but I certainly want to reiterate what uh, Frank said. Uh, Michelle Sr. and Michelle Jr. and Katharina have been nothing but uh, the most incredibly helpful staff on this project uh, from day one. So I want to just let, let everybody in the room know how wonderful they were to work with. Um, I'd also be remiss to maybe introduce uh, the, a few beautiful people in the audience other than Frank and Neil. So Mike Marco uh, is here. He just came in. Uh, uh, preservation Couple of the Year as awarded by uh, the West Palm Beach chapter of the American Institute of Architects two years ago, maybe two years ago, two or three years ago. Uh, and and uh, Mr. John Babiar is back here, just uh, purchased a beautiful historic property on, on North uh, Swinton Avenue that will be coming before you guys soon. And uh, Mr. George Long, of course, uh, here every day, every, every time you guys meet. 
Um, I'd like to get a point of clarification up front, if I can, from uh, the attorney's office. Uh, um, if you can, if we can make crystal clear, we, we only have four of the seven members of the board. So, um, can we make crystal clear what the what the the majority, uh, what the definition of the majority or, or uh, that has to take place in order for us to get an approval of, of those four? Yeah, it's three out of the four. So. Three out of the four. Not not. It doesn't have to be a full. Okay. Board, so okay. The majority of the members present. In, including for the variance as well. For, for I want to ask one more question on that. If it's two to two, because I suffered seven years in court over the treehouse because of a two to two vote, I assume that's a continuance. It's not a denial, it's not an approval. It's when a, all a two two is no action is taken. So, so that means it, it just fails, but it doesn't, it doesn't deny the application. So if it got a two two, they'd be, given the opportunity to make another motion, but if it, if it doesn't go through, then um, I think you would just work on, re I believe you would just work on rescheduling that with Michelle. Um, so no action would be taken, so you just. Wait till there was five. Right. <laughs> okay. I'd... Okay. Um, again, thank you for hearing, uh, being here this evening. Thank you for hearing this item. This uh, uh, first slide up on, on your screen in front of you is uh, Mr. Fontaine Fox. Fontaine Fox was a cartoonist uh, from Kentucky, uh, settled in Delray Beach along with uh, others, uh, poets, laureates, uh, writers, uh, several other cartoonists uh, to the point where Delray Beach was, was uh, known to have a colony of these very artistic people, and Mr. Fox Fontaine was uh, the ringleader of them in many ways. They would meet at the Colony Hotel uh, downtown uh, and and discuss their their business and their lives. And Mr. Fox Fontaine became a a bit of a real estate tycoon back in the day, buying property in the downtown area and 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 and, and very much along A one A. The house that uh, Frank and Nielsa have have lovingly uh, purchased and lived in for 27 years, 24, 25 years, uh, is Fox Fontaine's uh, original home. Um, uh, when we began the project, um, uh, I tried to do as much historic research on the home as possible. And uh, it was, it's quickly evident that uh, John Volk, who is this gentleman right here, is the architect, was the architect of uh, the Fontaine Fox home. And John Volk was a, 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 an architect for the socialites, let's say, of, of Palm Beach. And it was quite unusual for him to design a home this far south. Uh, but he, he and, and Mr. Uh, uh, Fox were personal friends. So uh, Fontaine Fox uh, convinced Mr. Volk to be his architect, and uh, away they went. Um, the, the home is very, very much based upon uh, Fontaine Fox's uh, cartoon, which is the mythical town of T uh, Tunerville and, and, and the trolley and, and uh, everything that's associated with that cartoon. So um, uh, at the time, John Volk is a, is a superstar, superstar architect. Um, I believe this is the only uh, single family residence uh, in Delray that he's designed. Uh, and at the time, uh, uh, the decade in which he designed the home, he partnered up with uh, 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 Gustav uh, Moss, uh, who is this gentleman here. And so for a brief period, they collaborated in a, in a, uh, 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 a firm, and, and uh, the, the work for the home basically uh, came from uh, Volk and Moss. And so uh, we're very, very proud of the, the lineage of the home and uh, and we're here to represent the, the, the preservation of it and, and respect everything that they, that they laid out. Uh, we have some beautiful, beautiful um, drone pictures of the property. This is, this, is a, uh, this is a site plan, if you will. This is, this is the property. So um, I'm not sure how Michelle got that, uh, that light to light up. But you can see the swimming pool in the, the right-hand part of the, uh, the image. We're not doing a doggone thing to the pool. To the left of that is the, the main residence. 
Um, yeah, how did she do that light? That one? No. So, um, you can, it's a compound. The, the house is very, very much a compound. It is not your traditional home. It's not a single structure. It's a, it's a collaboration and an assembly of multiple structures. And it's, it's, it's uh, very much a, uh, a meandering layout. Uh, faces due east. The ocean is at the top of the screen. Uh, there's an absolutely fabulous view of the ocean from uh, the master bedroom, which is a, a, the piece on the left. Uh, but it meanders to the west and goes back, and, and, and it's just an assembly of, of a multitude of, of different shapes, different roof configurations. Uh, and, and I contend that, that, that Fontaine Fox uh, had directed Volk to be as creative and to, and to, to design the house in an image of this, this mythical town called Tunerville, and, uh, and so it, 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 John Volk's work was nothing like that. His entire body of work uh, was very uh, uh, proper and, and, and symmetrical and, and mansion-like, and this was, this was way outside of his wheelhouse, and so uh, it just represents a very, very unique piece of property. Uh, and it's very heavily wooded, very, very natural landscape uh, exists on this piece, and it sticks out very much so because it's right there on the bottom of the screen and you can see the image that it has over to the ocean uh, so this is another view of it um, it's just it's just a, a magnificent collection of of different pieces and, and maybe they'll become a little bit more evident when i get to the drawings there's uh, the tree house it's a tree house that we have that anchors uh, the eastern portion of the site. There's a motor courtyard you can see below it and around it, and it's a pea gravel courtyard, a very, very natural setting. And you can see the two homes to our south, which would be to the left, and to our north, to the right. Uh, this is the view to the ocean, bird's eye view, if you will. Little arrows pointing to the property. And this is a cover of the book that Frank showed you a few moments ago. Uh, or that is, I should say. And so here we are. So the first thing that I did when, when uh, we started really getting into this thing was uh, I, I reached out to um, the city of Palm Beach, because John Volk, when he passed away, he donated his entire library of his, of his work, over 22,000 documents, to, uh, to a society in Palm Beach, uh, uh, and um, so that they could be viewed and appreciated uh, forever by people like me and, and, and the McKinney's. And so uh, I, I didn't take no for an answer from them. It took months for them to even understand uh, the, 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 the magnitude of this, this house back then, uh, you know, addresses were different, uh, descriptions were different. And so it was like finding a needle in a haystack, but, uh, out of persistence, we found it. And so, uh, several documents of the original, uh, design of the house of 1934, 1935, uh, uh, fell into our lap. And, and this little diagram is, uh, 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 the most important thing on this drawing is the tiny little single car garage on the upper right hand side of the drawing. Uh, the other images are um, details that he was obviously thinking of. Uh, this is a section through the main uh, upper part of, of the main house itself. And uh, this today, that space up there is, is the master bedroom and, 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 a, and a, a main piece in what we're trying to improve upon. Um, this document was just some, 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 some millwork detail. This is an interior elevation and another window uh, and or door detail. And then this guy right here, this is the Holy Grail. This is the original Fontaine Fox residence. Uh, and so when we found this, uh, we, we shifted gears and we went from uh, 
one train of thought to another. Th this house is essentially buried in, uh, in, this, in the core of what exists today. It's been modified so many times and added on to so many times that in, in a certain respect, it's unrecognizable. Uh, uh, but yet, he, here it is, and, and we know what it once looked like, and it, it influenced everything that we did from that, from that point forward. If you take a very careful look, there are very few notes on, on the elevations of the house. Uh, um, for example, it doesn't say uh, unpainted siding, uh, nor does it say painted siding. It just calls out siding. Uh, but the floor plan uh, of the lower level is, is that in the upper left-hand corner, and then the second level is that in the, in the lower left-hand corner. But three beautiful elevations of the house, as Frank referenced. The front door uh, faced and open to the south, N never ever uh, oriented itself to the east. It does today, but originally it was uh, to the south. So uh, here's our project. Um, the little image in the center of the cover sheet, at the top, top image is the existing image that you would see today. And the image below that is what the image would look like uh, uh, with your support this evening and the uh, various changes that we would like to make to it. And Frank is gonna show you a couple of renderings that we put together. Yep. Yep. So naturally, we have a, a, a full understanding of the site and its topography. Uh, it's not a typical flat piece of property. We, we went to great lengths to understand it. Uh, we have a, a, an existing site plan. So at the bottom right hand uh, of this image is the, 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 what is a two-car garage today. Uh, it just recently became known to us that uh, it was sometime in the 70s that the single-car garage uh, somehow became a two-car garage, um, uh, and then so the the if you look in the image at the upper part of the screen, the darker image represents the footprint of the original house, uh, and the lighter uh, graphic is, is uh, other pieces of the house as it meanders to the west and then to the south, uh, that occurred sometime after 1935 and before. Uh, uh, Frank and Nielsen bought the property, uh, and, and it's uh, we're we're very much unsure about how some of them came about, but we we know that they're all there. This is this is our after site plan, if you will. This is how we want to bring things together. Uh, an expansion of the garage at the bottom right from the two car to the three car. We, we're keeping the two car exactly as it is, just simply tacking on a third bay. Uh, very minimal change there. Uh, uh, does it go toward the east, toward the ocean? Yes, it does, but by uh, tw 12 feet, or 12 feet four, so very minimally. Has minimal impact on the entry drive off a A1A. Uh, has uh, minimal impact on the existing motor courtyard. Um, and uh, so this is our target uh, site plan that we're working toward uh, at the end of the day. This is just an enlarged version of that. This is rotated, now east is to our left. Uh, this, is, this is the existing condition, the footprint of the property, including the little tiny thing to the left and in the center, that's the treehouse of uh, a decade or so ago. Um, and uh, what we would, uh, th this, is, uh, this is our footprint on our proposed version, and I'll go through every one of these components uh, in, in much more detail and, and, and a slightly larger scale in, in a second. But, um, it's, a, it's, uh, it's unlike a house you've ever seen. It, it, floor plans are nothing like you've ever seen. The images are nothing like you've ever seen. Uh, uh, but it is, it is charming, it, it is comfortable, and it is an amazing place uh, to be. Um, this is, this is uh, Michelle has been asking lately that we put a composite set of uh, uh, floor plans together, and so these two things are, represent that. But, uh, um, Again, this is an enlarged view of the existing floor plan. Uh, we, we almost in one hand want to start out the presentation by coming into you and saying, the first, first and foremost, what we, what we want to start our list of improvements out to being as would be, would, would be to take, we're going to take the treehouse 
after, after it's uh, been situated there. Uh, we're going to take that guy down, we're going to spin it around, and we're going to put it on, on the grade, on ground, at the pool level, and we're going to convert it from a treehouse to a changing room. And so uh, we're sticking out that, that olive branch, if you will, and taking down something that was somewhat controversial a decade ago, and we're going to, uh, we're going to repurpose it and, uh, and, and free up the visual uh, 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 compatibility that you would see, now, that now you would see from A1A. And so it's, it just makes for a better end product, and that'll be evident in some of the other uh, renderings that I'm going to show you in, in a moment. Um, this is the uh, proposed, this is the existing second floor. This is the master uh, suite. Uh, so it's very compact, very tight, not, not uh, large, not, not, not oversized. Uh, it's, 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 it's got the right parts and pieces to it, you know, a, a reasonable walk-in closet, a reasonable uh, his and her shower, uh, the stair dominates the floor plan. Uh, the stair, we believe, is absolutely original. I mean, it, it, it has to be. So it's, it's one of the untouched features of the house. And so this, uh, this now represents uh, changes that we propose to the second floor. Uh, the, everything in gray are, are pieces that we uh, would propose to add uh, to make that second floor master suite uh, more livable in today's standards, in 2021 standards. Yes. So You're welcome to, but <laughs> so so the front, the the, fr the expansion of the front of the the uh, second floor, which is toward the east, uh, uh, we we reduced the size of the existing terrace that's out there now, so that it's it's uh, about two thirds the size of the existing of the existing. So um, so in the bottom left hand corner of this image. Uh, we had thought about and we had incorporated and we had uh, attempted to have a, a, a terrace that was an exact replica of what's out there today, but just simply shifted eastward. And we thought better of it. We actually made it smaller. Um, and we're, we're, we're re-emphasizing uh, a, a new entry into the property from the east uh, and making it uh, on axis with uh, some of the architecture uh, that you'll see in a second. Before you leave that, I just want yep. to make sure that one thing's really clear. Yep. So, uh, Michelle, if you're listening, could you come out and help us turn this thing into a, a pointer? The areas that are gray, so don't stay there. The areas that are gray are part of the existing footprint. Those are not being added onto. So the bottom gray part now is part of an existing deck that we're adding on to the master. Can you help us with that little? Get the light on it. Light. Oh, press and hold. Press and hold button. the top button. Oh. Okay. Wow. Oh. Okay. Okay. So right there, that that part of the gray is part of an existing balcony that we're going to absorb into and make the closet that's quite small now a little bit bigger. This part is also part of the existing footprint that we're absorbing into the air conditioned space of the master bedroom to make it a little bit larger, and this is a a flat roof, parapeted roof deck that is unaccessible. It's kind of an odd little addition at some point. You know, we don't know when it got added onto, but it's a flat roof, can't get to it. So we're gonna absorb that, it's part of the footprint. We're gonna absorb that into the master. So this whole footprint is still the same. It's just those gray areas are gonna become air conditioned. Now they are deck or flat roof. This is the only addition, which is that small balcony. Because we're, we're absorbing that balcony into the master, we're going to take that distance between that wall and that wall and create a balcony that's the same depth as what we have now. Perfect. It's... Yeah, Mr. Shard, I guess you were out there today, so, it may, so hopefully that makes sense with exactly what we're saying. Um... So this is the rear wing. This is the rear wing that's a, uh, the existing floor plan. 
this is, uh, these are the improvements that we uh, intend to make to that rear wing. We are adding a tiny bit of captured space right here. We're taking an outdoor covered four foot deep terrace and we're, we're capturing that. It's absolutely minimal square footage, but, but we're trying to make better use out of it. Uh, and that represents the only addition to the footprint. Uh, but uh, we've uh, connected this entire wing to the back western corner of the main residence, which is right here. Uh, we're, we're proposing to connect those two for the first time ever with a little tiny piece of architecture right here that we've uh, called the hyphen. So uh, if staff and others refer to the hyphen, it's this tiny little piece. And it's a, a critical little component that's literally tying one thing to another. So we gave it a fancy name. Uh, we are proposing a second level onto this wing. We were originally planning this for the second level above the garage, uh, but we went back to the drawing boards uh, and made it much more subordinate by moving it from an eastern component to a far western component. And so uh, it's, it's uh, far more supportable, in our opinion, being uh, that subordinate, being much more subordinate. Um, it is an absolute replica in plan of the floor below. And so uh, it, it just happens to contain uh, a couple of bedrooms because we, we had a, a net loss of one bedroom below uh, and it has a, uh, a bathroom. It uh, has a balcony right here, which uh, we're gonna design and you'll see in the, in the 2D uh, renderings that that balcony and a, a tiny little balcony there and a, a bigger balcony there, that these balconies are uh, reflective of other existing balconies that are out there. Uh, and so they're, they're very harmonious in their design. This is the original two-car garage. This isn't the original two-car garage. It's a two-car garage that appeared sometime in the 70s. The original garage was a one-car garage. And, and so uh, uh, if you hear staff talk about a progression of, uh, of, 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 of or the evolution of, of the garage, for example, it's, it's you know, the one car in 1935, sometime in the 70s, it went to a two-car. And today, we'd like it to go to a three-car. and. Uh, and this is the three car version of it with the tree house spun around and sitting now to its uh, upper left hand corner right there. So the tree, tree house will not be in view at all uh, from A1A. It, it does not pop up above the roof of the garage. Uh, and so you can make a, a strong case that it now is, is uh, subordinate as well. So let's get into the elevations. The top elevation is, is, is the existing conditions of today. Uh, the, the image below it is, is uh, of our proposal. Um, tree, tree house, gone. It, it's back behind that garage. The garage will have the identical imagery that it has to the east, uh, but its ridge line will be slightly higher, just a couple of feet higher. Um, the main house itself, um, the entry door, today's entry door is right here on the far right hand side of the front porch. Uh, we are retaining it in its, in its location, but we're making it uh, much more harmonious across the bottom uh, first floor elevation uh, by making it a nice set of double doors that match the other double doors that are, uh, that are already there, which would be that one and that one. So the terrace that Frank spoke of, there's, this is a terrace right now. It, it is a very awkward, uh, kind of a half mansard roofed terrace that flies across the front. Not original to Fontaine Fox's uh, design of 1935, uh, yet has uh, by, its, by, its, uh, uh, by the age uh, uh, that we associate it with uh, today, it, it is now historic. So uh, we have, we have that right there is, is the existing mansard way back there. We are leaving that part alone and we're only coming out f forward and, and eastward with a little tiny section of uh, uh, essentially a replica of a terrace, uh, but uh, uh, less than two thirds the size of what it 
is as is as it exists today. So uh, we're playing we're paying homage to to the to the to the axis of the house. Uh, uh, we're introducing a new set of steps that go right up the center of the house. Today they go up uh, the right hand side of the house. Uh, there's a there's a pretty uh, awkward sense of entry to the home right now. We're trying to improve upon that. Um, we, as we've stated a couple of times already, the, the front entry to the house was never to the east; it was to the south. So we feel like there's uh, flexibility in, in, in modifying that now because it's not an orig original entry uh, into the home. Uh, this is the south elevation of the house. Uh, uh, the image at, above is uh, existing. The image below is our proposal. Um, you can see there's there's a there's a there's some serious change in topography on the site. There's a, a drop in the back of the, the further west you go. There's uh, the the land drops off, and so we've got a lot of steps and changing in elevations that occur as you meander the property. Uh, we're not changing any of that. Uh, here's a, our hyphen is right here. Simple little uh, single story uh, dude that's going to just blend right in with the structure. Uh, to each side of it, it's gonna it's gonna look like it was meant to be. And uh, and then here's the extension of our terrace that we're talking about right there, uh, that's going to the to the east, and and you can you can see how uh, you compare it with the image above and just get a feel for how uh, few feet that it goes out in fr in front of the existing conditions. Th these are the elevations to the north. Um, very, very, very little change. We, we, we are, uh, uh, this piece right here uh, was built uh, in 2013. So this is a, a, a modern infill piece, if you will. So we're, we're going to uh, propose to, uh, and the windows that were used in it were, were windows that were salvaged from uh, another section of the house uh, that was severed off when the property was subdivided so that they're, they're uh, we, uh, we've uh, asked staff and we've got support from staff uh, to rearrange those guys a bit and, and have them make more sense with uh, the kitchen space that is on the other side of them. Um, we're doing some very little modification. There's several different crazy roof things happening back here uh, that we have no documentation on and, and can't get a uh, a sense of the, the historic value that they bring to the to the plate. So uh, we're cleaning them up a bit in this area, and I'll show you a much more interesting elevation of those in the next slide, because this is what it looks like uh, from the west. Uh, again, the image at, above is existing, uh, and hopefully, I mean, just glancing at those two images, you can see how how uh, haphazard the window pattern is, for example, on, on the upper image. And how on the lower image we're trying to lend a little bit of formality and rhythm and uh, uh, logic to them. And so uh, we're completely uh, re redesigning and introducing three sets of French doors there. This little guy right there is our hyphen connecting this structure with this. Uh, uh, right now it is a, it's an open breezeway, a walkway that you can just walk between the two buildings. It's, uh, seven feet wide, it's, so it's very, very tiny. Uh, and this is the new second level that we are adding to the rear wing uh, that uh, we will absolutely differentiate between uh, it and the historic piece on the bottom. We, we'll, we'll propose to use uh, a different, uh, a man-made hardy board or an AZAC on, on it and not real wood siding, and we'll uh, work with staff to dif differentiate it in, in color uh, as you can tell by some of the images, all the roof, every roof on the property is a Western uh, red cedar shake roof. So, so uh, we are not changing that out at all. This is a very simple image of the existing rear wing. Um, and as Frank also alluded to, uh, just a few days ago, we were given some evidence of, of the, these were at one time, little individual structures, like this little guy right there was at one time an individual freestanding little guy, and this guy right there was a freestanding guy, and at some point, they were connected one to the other, but that's the image uh, that exists today. That's uh, 
that faces our pool. And, that, and then uh, this graphic is meant to show, uh, again, the existing elevation as it exists today and what we're proposing uh, in, in our uh, presentation tonight. We are uh, putting an entire second floor onto this wing. Uh, and it doesn't quite make up the overall square footage that we had above our garage when we were studying that to the east, but it, it comes close. And so, uh, again, it contains a couple of bedrooms, uh, a new stair, and a bath, and is, is very modest. Um, this is the garage. Images at the top, uh, actually all of them are existing. Uh, this is our proposed garage. Very, very uh, simple. Uh, addition of, 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 of a third bay, uh, about as straightforward forward architecturally as you can get. Uh, you guys really don't care about windows, but uh, we are changing out every single window on the property. There isn't a single impact resistant window on the property. Every single window uh, will be changed out with the exact configuration that it has. Uh, and uh, so we've shown all that, drawn all that up for Michelle and the staff. Uh, we have civil documentation uh, that we're obligated to provide staff, uh, showing the absolute minimal change to the site and the drive. And uh, finally, I'll leave you with a couple of images uh, that are also replicated on the boards down in front of you, but, but uh, these are intended to represent uh, the end product. Uh, um, uh, this is this being the western uh, rear wing. This is the hyphen that you can see right in there. This is all existing right here. That was the piece built in uh, 2013. This is the original uh, body of the home there, but with our little addition on the front. Uh, and there you can see the treehouse. You can catch a glimpse of the treehouse right there, as seen from the west. And there's our uh, garage that uh, virtually uh, the same image and piece that it uh, exists today, but just with the third bay. This is what uh, we think the public will see from A1A, uh, if they were maybe 25 feet tall. But the uh, but, uh, that uh, three-car garage up front, treehouse is gone. There's the second story of the wing, which is to the very rear of the property. Can't, we, we can't get any more subordinate in terms of getting any further off the public right away. And then uh, here's our, 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 our new entry into the home, uh, a fully glazed, very, very, I, I mean, I've been practicing architecture for 34 years. I've never seen uh, a feature, anything like this. Uh, so we, uh, we are uh, retaining it, we're, clean, we're, we're uh, honoring it, we're, key, we're, we're, we're Continuing the homage to, to Tunerville and to Fontaine Fox and to uh, to John Volk and uh, uh, we're here to uh, answer any questions. Hmm? Before we turn it over to staff. Before we turn it over to staff. Just borrow this. Okay. Can I talk from up here? No. No. Yeah, you. Can. you gotta, yeah. Okay. It's just it videos maybe at the could, podium. Maybe you could hold those up. <laughs> Okay, so one of the things that we're proud of is in September when we were on the agenda and we got the, the staff report, it's important to point out that, that the second floor, and you probably all saw this because you got the packages, was on top of that garage. And in the staff report, it was mentioned that in, in staff's words, there was ample room to the west of the garage on the west back side of the property to add what was proposed over the top of the garage not my words, staff's words. So we said, okay, I mean, it, it, if I was building this new today, of course you'd want to put the guest wing over the garage because you have an ocean view. But we took them, took staff at, you know, as a great, great suggestion, we're going to take the second floor, reduce it in square footage, and put it over the top of the existing footprint of the existing guest house. That was a huge change. And it's so far back that unless you're a bird, you're not gonna see that from any public domain. The second thing that was on the staff report is this hyphen was 
similar to the Louvre and, and other instances where we found evidence that two historic structures were connected with a glass structure, that was all glass, roof, sides. It was suggested by staff that we mimic this roof, take the glass off the roof, and just put the glass doors on either side. So we, we went ahead and did that. The master bedroom had a bigger balcony. Um, and between staff and my neighbor, who wasn't happy about the balcony, we reduced that from the first application. So, you know, we feel as though we, we read all 19 pages of that first report and took them to heart. Um, and that's what, what you would see today. The, the color uh, in the rendering looks a little whiter than what we would probably do. I think a whitewash, and when I was showing the house to, to Jim today, um, his question was, what about the character of the wood? You know, that, that, that natural cypress is just so beautiful. Now, after being on there for 86 years, when you buy a piece of cypress now, you, you don't get one by eight, you get three, three quarters by seven and three quarters. So whatever we add on, it's gonna be very difficult to match that. That's why putting some color on the wood is gonna homogenize it versus leaving it brown or natural, you'll be able to tell, as I pointed out today to Jim, I had to replace some rotten wood over the years, just pieces of board, and it's clear it'll take 80 years to catch up with the weathering. It's the same species, it's just not weathering. So a, a nice whitewash would homogenize everything. And, and we just feel like this is, you know, this is a, a, other than the two comments that they made at the end, the suggestions, the conditions, where the third car, the third bay on the garage would be delineated better than what we have, um, we'll have to figure out a way to do that. And also on the back to make sure the second floor of the new guest wing was clearly different because it doesn't show that on this rendering. Those, those were new things. We didn't have a chance to modify that on these, these renderings. Lastly, we, we have, uh, you, I, you, I know you've seen them and I, Pretty sure that Michelle handed them out, but I'm going to hand them to you as well. Uh, two letters from adjoining neighbors that are in support of the project. Uh, the gentleman to our extreme west and to our extreme east. Uh, we have three letters. I'm sorry. There's, three, there's a third letter in here that, that came in. And, and, and in this little package, I'm also giving you uh, six different photographs of existing conditions uh, that we feel are competent and uh, uh, substantial evidence that the house was was heavily whitewashed. Uh, their their photos and testimonials from prior owners, um, and so I'm going to hand those to Diane, and she, she can enter one of them into the file, and then then everybody can have a copy of that. And I, I know staff is going to show those photos up on the screen, and we could talk about those maybe at that time. But thank you very much for for your attention. Nielsa, let me introduce uh, Nielsa McKinney. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Nielsa McKinney, and myself with my husband, I own 610 North Ocean Boulevard. As we move forward with everything that you have absorbed between what Roger presented and what my husband shared, I do want to add and remind everybody on the board that this has been our home and we have many wonderful memories in this home and this home has become part of us I like to say this home has it a soul and this home has brought us through the years through wonderful memories challenging times and everything that was represented to you today was done thoughtfully and with great help from the staff. And we appreciated all their comments and we executed on their comments. So my point is, please remember this is our home and we are very, very excited to give it the TLC it desperately needs. Thank you. So that concludes our presentation, you guys. I hope you found it exciting, and, and we look forward to answering a few questions at the end of staff's presentation. Thank you.
Just safety purposes for distance. Thank you so much. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. I appreciate it, Roger. Okay, Michelle Hoyland, Principal Planner, Development Services Department, for the record. Uh, we're here to talk this evening about 610 North Ocean Boulevard. This property is individually listed to the local register of historic places. It's known as the Fontaine Fox Properties. Um, there, there's a lot to go over. I want to focus on the history because I know the board's always interested in the backstory and the history on the property. So you'll see it's on the west side of North Ocean. This is directly across the street from the North Beach access. Um, this is a photograph of the south side of the house, which um, serves as really the primary facade. Here's an aerial photo. I just want to get you acclimated with the site. So the property contains approximately 0.663 acres. It um, is Lot 1, Ocean Apple Estates, Plat 3. There's a long storied history on the property with the original owner, subsequent owners, and the subdivision of the property that occurred over the years. So originally this property included the lot to the east, um, the lot to the north, which you'll see is that two-story house right here and properties to the west. It was subdivided into several lots, um, leaving the Fontaine Fox House on the parcel that you see here today. The historic designation was originally established by Ordinance 70-89, and it was named after its original first owner, Fontaine Fox, a cartoonist of both national and international acclaim. Fox was best known for his cartoon, The Tunerville Trolley, also The Tunerville Folks, he was born in 1884 in Louisville, Kentucky. He began his career as a cartoonist in grammar school, continuing throughout high school when he began working at the Louisville Herald as a reporter and a cartoonist. After two years of study at the University of Indiana, where he, he studied and drew cartoons part-time, he returned to Kentucky to work at the Louisville Times until the Chicago Post gave him national recognition and distribution in 1915. Much of the small town subject matter for his cartoons came from people he knew in the then suburban and rural Louisville. The cartoon was syndicated throughout the world, appearing in several languages. Fox moved to Delray Beach in 1931 after having visited here in the 1920s. In coming to Delray, he joined a number of well-known artists and writers who, by making Delray Beach their home, created an artist and writer's colony. This is much storied fame for Delray Beach and we've been known for that for a very long time. Mr. Fox was one of those first folks that came here. Those other people included cartoonist Herb Roth, whose cartoons reflected life in Delray, Wood Cowan, writers Hugh McNair Kyler, Clarence Buddington Kellens, Nina Wilcox Putnam whose articles published in Good Housekeeping magazine and were illustrated by another Delray Beach resident, Anita Brown, and poet Edna St. Vincent Millay. Fox made his studio on the second floor of the arcade tap room. Today, many of you might know it's the wine room that's on the ground floor. That was the hub of winter activity in Delray Beach. Fox was an accomplished golfer and the author of several books and articles, including a series which ran in many papers that was based on his narrow escape in 1939 from war-torn Europe. During the war, he was a member of the Division of Pictorial Publicity. In the late 30s, Fox had a long-term relationship with friendship with architect John Volk. He commissioned him to design the house at 610 North Ocean Boulevard. 
Volk was also the architect of Fox's home just north of 610. That home is still there. It's not on the local register of historic places. It's two houses north of this property. He was also the, um, Fox was the owner of several other properties and Volk designed many properties in our county and in Delray Beach. The subject house is historically significant because of its architectural style and it represents one of a few remaining beach cottages reflecting the Cape Cod bungalow style, typical of houses built on North Ocean Boulevard from Delray Beach to Manalapan, and of course, for its association with Fontaine Fox. Volk was born in 1901. He came to the U.S. when he was nine years old. He was a, st a student of Columbia University School of Architecture, as well as and I'm going to probably murder the name, Ecole des Beaux Arts in Paris. Yeah. John Volk arrived in Palm Beach in 1925 while Addison Meisner was building Spanish and Mediterranean style mansions for wealthy families. A prolific architect, John Volk designed over a thousand houses, theaters, and buildings all over the world. Some of the world's most powerful and wealthy people commissioned him to design their homes, including William Paley, George Vanderbilt, Henry Ford II, Herbert Pulitzer, Horace Dodge II, and John Phipps. Volk has often been called the last of the original Palm Beach architects, which included Addison Meisner, Maurice Faccio, and Marion Sims Wyeth. In 1926, he formed a partnership with Gustav Moss, which lasted almost 10 years. There are a lot of Moss buildings in our city, including the train station. Volk's homes, which number several hundred scattered along the coast, covered a broad range of designs from Spanish and Italian motifs to Normandy, Bermuda, Regent, classical, classical oriental, bungalow, and what he called British colonial. Known to have broken the excesses of the Mediterranean style after the Depression, Volk began designing British colonial houses that he could, that could be built for 45 cents a square foot versus $2 per square foot for the Spanish mansions. He related an article in Architectural Digest in 1972. When the market crashed and the Depression followed, there wasn't a client in sight who wanted to build the elaborate Spanish house. Everyone was broke. Those who weren't didn't want to make a show of their money. It was during this time period that the houses along North Ocean Boulevard were designed. Volk continued to design homes until his death in 84. Just a little backstory on the property. Um, there's also information in the staff report about how the inspiration for the house was taken from Fontaine Fox's hometown, Louisville, and the style of architecture there in the wood frame. Uh, which that was the inspiration for the, his designs in the Toonerville Trolley and Toonerville Folk um, comics, which have been highlighted in your staff report. So I'm going to go through, this is a bit of a long presentation. I will try not to be duplicitous um, to the applicant's presentation, but I do feel that we need to cover a lot of ground here. I'm showing you photographs of the property. We were invited by the owners to come out and tour it. It is quite lovely um, and has a lot of its original form that's existing uh, from the original house. So here you can see the guest house in the rear. This photograph is taken of the home, um, the principal home, the main residence. There's a deck that surrounds its elevated in sections. This is a um, former cottage in the back here um, known as the guest wing. This is the back side of the guest wing. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the garage. I have a bit of new information to share with the board and the owners about where we think the original garage may have been. We think it might have been this. Um, this is the back side of the main structure. This portion of the main structure is noted on original um, or 1950s plans as a cottage that was uh, connected to the main house. This is the existing garage in the front of the property. This is what you um, see when you first enter the site off the driveway, you see the side of the garage. Then you have the north facing or the front of the garage. This is the tree house. So if we can talk a little bit about this. In 2001, the applicant constructed this tree house 
um, in front of the historic Fontaine Fox House without obtaining HPV approval or a building permit. The elaborate and detailed treehouse was freestanding yet attached to the historic structure via a footbridge. In September 2002, the HPB reviewed the COA for the as-built accessory structure, where the request was denied based on a failure to make positive findings with the LDRs, the design guidelines, the comp plan, and the Secretary of the Interior standards. The owners appealed the request to the commission, and the commission reviewed it and also had a 2-2 vote, which was a no-action vote. Um, that, that vote was interpreted as a denial at that time. So then the owners filed an appeal to the circuit court. That, um, that vote was determined to be no action by the circuit court and it was remanded back to the city um, to, to have an, a new review completed. So in 2008, six years later, the commission again denied the appeal request on a 5-0 vote um, later, the owner and the, the commission entered into a property arrangement or agreement um, requiring that the COA be approved by the Historic Preservation Board by a certain date. Um, there was also a requirement to move the treehouse to a separate area that would not block the Fontaine Fox House. And late also there was um, a, a condition that stated if they were not able to obtain a building permit that the owner would agree to remove the structure. So it went to HPB and um, HPB approved the treehouse in this location subsequently to all of that review. Michelle, if we can just take a moment. I, I think she's just taking a quick break, but we actually don't have a quorum. I understand. So subsequently in 2009, HPB approved the treehouse. Um, it did get permits and they were able to move forward with the project. Um, later in 2013, a variance was approved for in addition to the north side of the property um, along with a variance request. And that was handled by Francisco Perez at that time. Um, what was added was a addition that connected this structure to the main house um, that serves as a bedroom right now in, inside the home. So we did um, an elaborate amount of research from the moment we started talking about the property with the owner and the architect all the way up until this week. Um, it's been a bit much to research because of the platting that has changed over the years, but we were really lucky to find quite a bit of documentation um, on the property. Here you can see this is ownership information. Um, after Fontaine Fox owned the property, um, the Mott family, which um, is the Mott's applesauce, Mott's apple juice, owned the property. You can see lot three and four which is the property we're talking about, plus the, across A1A to the right of the screen were the parcels included on this property. North of that um, was where the Fox Estate was. Uh, that's a Monterey style house that's over on that property. So these are the yellow cards that the um, applicants mentioned in their presentation. Um, these basically, before we had computers, were the way we tracked building permits at the city of Delray Beach. You can see at the top of the screen, there's numbers. Um, that's a permit number, the year it was done. So we have three of these. You also see in the center of the page that there's a building plan. The building plan is very helpful to staff because this was a recordation of the changes that occurred over time. So you can see, um, a, B, the, the structure noted garage, they're not noted as they exist on the site. They were noted for general sizing requirements because this was a document that was used for taxing purposes. So we have the garage, to the left of that a 57 edition, to the left of that a 58 edition, and then a 60 edition. Um, so that's continuously the same through all of these documents. 
Um, you can see those changes over time with the additions. The structure that has been added on to the most in the 50s and 60s is that guest wing structure in the back. Um, the main structure had an addition in the 70s and then in the th 2000s, so we'll review that as well. This one's a little bit more organized, this drawing. You can see um, you know, the arrangement of the structures on the property. So it, we believe it had been, the guest cottage had been added on to three times. These are the original 1934 John Volk plans. Mr. Cope shared them in his presentation. Um, you can see the east elevation on the left side of the screen, the north elevation on the right. So this would be the back of the house that has the very small setback now today. And this is the south, which served as the front, the primary entrance of the home. Here we have a survey from 1957. This was part of a 71 building permit. Um, we can see here the structures that existed at the time of 57. So you can see that this was the original main house. That's that cottage in the back that has since been filled in with an addition. And then this frame garage. So I believe we've talked in the staff report about the garage being at the front of the property, but I actually think it was this in the back of the property. Um, this is what we just found in the last couple of days. And then we have a 1971 actual permit documents, which were prepared by Jacobson and Curry. Bob Curry was the architect at the time. Um, you can see a little structure down here in the corner. That was back here in the back of the property. This is a, I don't know, four foot at least difference in grade where you have to step downstairs to get to this back, whole back section of the property that still exists. This is up at a higher grade today. And so a little zoomed in, we can see everything in the blue colors were, um, or the, the purpley blue colors were the structures that existed at the time of 71. The red were the additions that were done at that time. So the garage up in the front, I believe, um, based on these documents, that notes scheme B. So I think that was added at this time um, based on the fact that it's not on the 57 survey. It's kind of like playing Clue with some of these building permits. There's quite a bit to look at. So here is a difference between the 34 on the top and the 71 permits that are on the bottom. Um, the home did have some adjustments. You can see to the front facade um, right here to right here, um, plus that porch that was added on. The main addition that was done at this time of 71 was focused on the back of the house here. Um, that was a, a small rooftop addition put in the rear to not detract from the front elevation. Now we weren't historic at the time in 71, but the um, Mr. Curry was still re obviously recogni recognizing the importance of this property and the owner that um, had built it. So here's the 2013 permit. What you're seeing in red is a area that was demolished. So the portion right up here where my pointer is, that was a structure that was removed. And this was a deck that was removed off the back. This was done because in 13, the property was replatted to create the lot to the north. This is the area where Mr. McKinney um, mentioned the buffer, the landscape buffer that does exist, a 13 foot buffer on the north end of the property. Um, but that little addition there had to be taken off in order to, so that this didn't encroach onto the new lot. So at the time, they came through the process with Francisco Perez, local architect, and that's when they connected the house to that cottage in the back through that one-story addition. Um, there were some other minor modifications made at this time as well, but it was, um, the additions were focused away from that front. This is um, from the building permit drawing, the perspective view of what was added. And again, this is the structure that was added at that time. So um, we also note that the balcony was added at this time, that little Romeo Juliet type balcony that was not original to the house. So here we have the current survey today um, with the properties as the buildings in blue as they're situated on the site. 
and we're going to start working through the drawings because I know there's quite a bit in the staff report to discuss um, everything that you see in red or this purple color. Um, these are additions. So the first uh, thing we have here that you'll see is the site plan um, with the addition that's focused on the front. A1A is out here. Um, that's an addition to the street facing side of the building, the garage. This is a second story addition and some additional ground floor space along with that hyphen. So I'm going to move a little quicker through these because I have quite a few slides. I also reoriented the plans so they do appear upside down on your drawing. And that was just so that we could stay oriented on the site with north at the top of the screen. Um, so here's that first floor plan. You'll see this um, L-shaped structure that's in the middle of the screen. This is a covered walkway that connects from the main house over to the garage. The tree house is being removed um, from the center of the property here, and it's going to be situated down at the um, southwest corner of the existing garage. This is the existing plan for the main residence, and um, again, north is at the top of the page. We see the red sections are what's being added. Again, um, A1A is on the right side of the screen. Remember, that's the street facing. So here you can see existing and proposed. Everything in red is an addition. Um, there are modifications that are happening to the structure, including window changes. Um, you can see there's a little window proposed above the door. Um, of this um, gable window section right here. It's a little bit larger than it was originally, so there's some shifts happening as well. Um, this we can I put in here so we can come back and forth to if you had questions. You really cannot see the house, not that that's a justification to make changes. It was just difficult to see the original form of the house, how it exists today because of the landscaping that's on the site. There's some really beautiful trees out there. Um, this is their perspective drawing. Um, so again, you can see the form and the mass of what's happening and changing on that original side of the house. So now we're going to talk about the south elevation. Um, and I'm mainly just going through the changes and then we'll do the analysis. This is the section that's new. Um, there is missing from the drawings the guest wing, and I understand that the architect has provided us with a section view so that we could see the original structure, um, but we don't actually have a north and south elevation for the guest wing. That will need to be included with the resubmittal um, should they get approved and get certified. And again, for reference, that's the present day south side of the home. You can see there are blue framed windows. Um, some awnings that exist on this side. The siding is cypress with a cedar shake roof. And here again is that south elevation just highlighting um, the original portion of the house. This is the north elevation. So this is the side where the variance is being requested and um, the addition that's focused over here on, on the left side of the screen is on the north and faces the east side of the home. Um, there were, was a discussion about these windows that were used from the original structure and they were repurposed. Um, you know, we've had a lot of conversations with the owner and the architect. We are not giving support either way. That's not our job. We try to encourage the applicant to utilize the requirements of the code and we try to provide some guidance on what we think the board would do with the request. So. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to be clear that we, we weren't specifically saying we support the change. We were saying that the change could be met by doing X, Y, and Z. Again, we need to see that guest wing on this elevation drawing, which we don't see. I'm overestimating, I'm sure, the size of it. Um, so I don't want to in any way misguide the board that that's the size of the guest wing. I'm merely highlighting that's the area where it would be drawn on the page. So now let's talk about the guest wing. Um, we did go inside this guest wing and you can totally feel that this is a building that's been added onto multiple times over the years. It's compartmentalized, it's different floor heights inside of it. 
um, from east to west. You've got a very low area in the back and from uh, north to south. It's just very, um, very unusual inside of here. So you can feel that it was added onto. And there are a few bedrooms inside of that structure. So the applicant is proposing to connect it. We did have a lot of conversations over this area, which we are all referring to as a hyphen. That's a technical term that's in the Secretary of the Interior standards as a way to connect structures um, so that you don't affect the historic integrity of the original historic structure. So the first floor will have this area here down in red. That's a new um, addition to the front of it. And then this entire second story addition added as well. Um, this is bedrooms and bathrooms that are primarily in, in this guest wing. This is the area if you were standing on the property. The left is in the very back of the property and we're looking east. And the right is standing about in the middle of the property looking west. This is where the hyphen is going to go. So it's they did make some adjustments and I think that's... Um, meeting the requirements of the code for its design. Here we have the design of the guest cottage on the top is the existing, on the bottom is the proposed. You will see, and we'll talk a little more about this, um, the way this has been designed, there's been no recesses or articulations that communicate to the trained eye that this is an addition. So that's the kind of the threshold that professionals in historic preservation look at is you should be able to tell what was added on. Um, you can see we've lost a bit of the original shape and form of the building through these original gables. Um, you know, would have been nice to have seen maybe that gable preserved on the ground floor. Up at the top side of the screen over here, this is what I believe was the original garage that was drawn on those 34 Volk plans, but I really would like to kind of review it a little bit closer with Roger to get his professional opinion. Um, the point we're trying to make is the property has had a lot of cumulative changes over its history. Um, but yes, yeah, so we do think that there are some adjustments that could have been made to have a second story addition in this area, but still respect that progression of change that's occurred over the years on that section. It is the best location for an addition is in the rear of the property as the guidance provides from the Secretary of the Interior. Um, that's a view, just a zoomed in view of what that area looks like. I think there's definitely some potential for um, putting those historic changes into that that elevation. Here on the rear of the building, this is the west elevation. Um, you know, we do have some blank walls in this area. Um, it does look out over a very large green area that extends down the whole west side of the property. Um, there are adjustments being made to the guest cottage on the left side of the screen. Uh, those are include window and, and articulation changes with the way that was originally designed. Um, that's a view of their drawing that they've provided a um, perspective view from the west. So now we really start to talk about the things that were identified in the staff report and what the concerns are. Um, there are a number of different things that are required for consistency, compatibility, and adherence to the Secretary of the Interior standards and in how a project is designed. Standard 1, 2, 3, 5, 9, and 10 are all applicable to this property. Um, we're also considering, the board is also considering a waiver request. That waiver is to allow this second story addition on the guest cottage. Originally, the waiver was being applied for for the, the garage in the front, and because they shifted it to the back, they still get to request that waiver. Um, we're looking at things in the standards, very specifically about the window frame colors. We're going to talk about the paint of the building, um, the exterior siding of the building. So if we first take that, let's maybe address the paint um, color of the building, because we've had quite a few discussions with the applicant and the architect and the historic research. There's so much um, 
that we've done to try to document what was original to this structure. I mean, nobody um, has a crystal ball and can go back to look in time. But these are the pictures I wanted to show. So on the left, this was provided by the owner. There's a small swath of paint underneath the eave here that's white. And on the right, we see a photograph that came from, I believe, Mr. Wilson and his wife, um, where you can see what they are calling a whitewash. I think that the house was always a cypress color on the outside, and raw wood, and this is a uh, faded, almost patina that happened to that wood. And what we're seeing on the left is that the wood's been sealed. Um, uh, for that cedar shake or cedar siding. So in the staff report, we've addressed a few things that came up in our research. One was a letter from Mr. Wilson in 1989, um, where it was indicated that the building, quote, portray portrays the materials and design of an era of distinctive architectural style to wit natural wood reflective of traditional Cypress construction, end quote. Um, Elizabeth Schonard, who was the daughter of Fontaine Fox, wrote to Lillian Jane Volk um, regarding the design of the structure, and we have that letter. And she said in that letter, it was, all, it was very attractive, all Cypress, and yet very simple, the way I think Florida houses should be of wood. So the guidance in the Secretary of the Interior Standards is if you have wood that's raw wood, you shouldn't paint it. If you have painted wood, you shouldn't strip it. So if the house has been painted once before and it had been stripped and gone through some measure to change that exterior, um, I, I think you know the board will have to consider that if, if whether or not painting it's appropriate or a whitewash or um, what the solution might be to the request that's been made. So I'm gonna go back a few here. Um, So these are the Secretary of the Interior Standards. This is the big book. I meant to bring this tonight to share it with you, but it's a very large book. We use this, the architects use this, the owners can use it. This is the recommended and not recommended approaches on how you treat or rehabilitate a historic property. Um, it talks about how you place the new use within um, a structure that's there, and if the expansion happens, it's you know, needs to be met by altering non-character -char defining features um, that you identify, retain, and preserve. Entrance and porches, which we've identified this in our staff report as well. Um, not to cut new entrances on a primary facade. Remove or substantially change entrances and porches, which are important in defining the overall historic character. One thing we know over time is that the original form of the original 34 face, the south face of the structure, has, has pretty much been preserved in its shape and form. Um, the changes that happened in the 70s were minor, um, and then now we're looking at something that's further modifying that, that front elevation. We've also expressed in our staff report some concern with respect to the windows. Um, there are a lot of changes to the windows happening, such as reorganization of the location of windows. We aren't, while we always try to encourage property owners to retain original wood windows, we understand that they may want to go to an aluminum window and the board has approved those in the past and so has staff. Um, so shifting the frames happens to meet hur hurricane impact requirements. You can also meet those requirements with wood frame windows that are hurricane impact or non-impact windows with the proper shutter system and that can range anywhere from aluminum shutters to wood shutters that close to a screen material that gets screwed onto the building that still allows some light to come through. Our issue is in relation to the, the shift of the windows, the location, the changes in the location um, that's happening throughout the structure. We have also um, expressed in the staff report some concerns with respect to the expansion on the east side of the main structure. And we're providing you here with the Secretary of the Interior Standards what's the recommended approach. And I'm not really sure if the board 
um, will consider that this is meeting the requirements of that code and those guidelines. Um, we have identified that some consideration could be given to differentiating the new additions from the existing structures, and that goes for all of the structures on the site, from the garage to the guest wing to the main home. Um, this one here I've talked a little bit about already, but again, we are identifying um, that this, this is a concern. Although this is the area where there's been the most change cumulatively over time on the property from the 60s and on, uh, 50s, 60s and on. So we, we no longer have the original form of what was here, but we can still kind of see the gable that we believe existed where that might have been a garage in this part of the property. Um, I'm provided this for you because I think it's important to note that the applicant did work um, to go through modification of the plan that was originally supposed to go to the board in September. This was what the garage looked like at that time um, with the proposed addition of the additional bay and the second story to that garage. So they have made adjustments um, and revised their request to ensure that the addition is in a more inconspicuous location. So our concern was we're putting this large two-story forward of the original structure and that that was raising some red flags so I think that was a definite improvement to take that addition and move it back here over top of the guest cottage how it's executed I think um, the board should consider some discussion with the applicant about the um, articulation and recesses that might be incorporated on this change here so now that leads me to the garage, and I'm really trying not to rush, but I, I don't want to spend an inordinate amount of time on this. So if you feel I've missed something, please let me know in the question section. Um, this is the existing garage floor plan. This is the garage that's east on the property. So it's at the um, southeast corner of the site and included, and we wrote about this in our staff report because at the time we were thinking this was the one car garage that became the two-car garage that's now becoming a three-car garage. If it really was originally a two-car garage, as I think our permit research indicated, um, rather than noting what we said in the staff report, which was articulating the progression of changes on this structure from one to two to three, I think it can be handled by articulating the change from a two to a three-car garage, maybe through architectural design of some additional gables or I'm not sure, I don't like to tell the architect how to do the design, but I think that there's some opportunity here to address that historic progression. Um, great news is that the treehouse is coming down from in front of the house and it's being converted to a pool cabana house, which will be situated to the west side of the garage. It's also noted that the garage roof will be coming off of this original structure and a new roof will be constructed over top of it. It's about a foot higher than the original um, height of the garage that sits there today. And for reference, this is that garage. This is the east side elevation. We've highlighted it red because this side will be new to the front of the property. You can see the relocated treehouse peeking out from the back there. Um, that's the side that I'm referencing here. And again, the treehouse for reference. This is the west side of the garage. So if you were standing in the pool area looking east um, towards the garage, this is what you would see. The red on the top of the screen down here, that is indicating the increased height and new roof um, that's being added to make that garage wider. Um, so I've, I've already gone through this, but I've put this in the presentation should we need to go back to it. Um, I am not certain that this was the garage that was enlarged in the 1950s. I think that was in the back. I don't, I think this was added to the property in the 70s as I've illustrated in the presentation. Uh, we've already talked through the paint. I did jump forward on that. I just wanted to get that addressed um, in my presentation sooner than later. Um, the variance, and if I can back up just a bit, let's talk through the variance and specifically what's happening on the site. 
Um, there already is a variance approved on the property on the north side of the site. That was approved in 2013 um, with the application that Mr. McKinney, Mr. and Mrs. McKinney made with Francisco Perez at the time of the platting. Um, so it, you can see here by the survey documents, the house is right on the property line. When you're standing inside of the house, which we did and looked out these windows here, um, you can see this very large landscape buffer is heavily planted between the two properties. And that was done as a um, proffered type of arrangement so that there could still be a, the large lot size on the property to the north that's required by the code. So I, I think that what's happening here is the additional variance that's being requested is happening because some of the addition is going up and when you increase that and go up and out a little bit more, you have to ask for the variance again. So that's why we're back asking for a one foot variance on the north, um, the applicant's asking for a one foot variance on the north property line. Um, there are standards findings they're re referred to in your staff report. The Historic Preservation Board has a specific set of findings um, that they utilize when it comes to a variance and you can see that they're slightly different than the variance findings for non-historic properties. Um, that the variance is necessary to maintain the historic character of a property and demonstrating the granting of the variance will not be contrary to the public in interest, safety, or welfare. Special conditions and circumstances exist because of the historic setting, location, nature, or character of the land, structure, pertinent sign. There are st special circumstance, circumstances that exist, um, but they are not in relation to the site's historic setting. Those circumstances are in relation to the platting um, that happened in 2013. So as you start reviewing these, it's up to the board to decide whether or not the applicant has met the um, requirements and proved through their justification statement um, so, you know, we are saying that there's a historic setting on the site and special circumstances exist um, that aren't applicable to other lands or structures, but it is because that property is located so close to the north property line. But a variance already exists there, so are we making it any worse by approving an additional variance on that side? Um, you'll have to go through these, or if you have already read them, little or literal interpretation of the provisions of existing ordinances would alter the historic character of the district or the site, um, that the variance will not significantly diminish the historic character of the site, that the variance is necessary to accommodate an appropriate adaptive reuse of a historic building structure or site. So the, the use is an expansion, it's not a change from residential to commercial, but these are some of the findings that um, the board needs to consider. There's also specific waiver findings, and that is for the building in the rear to be um, not secondary and subordinate to that structure. Um, and those findings are here, not adversely affect the neighboring area, not significantly diminish the provision of public facilities, not create an unsafe situation, and that it doesn't grant in a special privilege and that the same waiver could be granted under similar circumstances on other properties. So um, these are the COA findings. We always include them in the staff report and the um, presentation. You also have the visual compatibility standards, which we've provided, provided a thorough analysis of those in our um, staff report. The 10 Secretary of the Interior standards um, that is included as well. The um, requirements of the code state that the board needs to make a finding that the proposal is in compliance with all of these items, um, as well as the comprehensive plan. I really do feel like I rushed a bit, but I'm sure people are sitting here saying, talked plenty. Um, I hope that you've had all of the presentation, that if there's anything additional that you feel I've missed or not covered that was in the staff report, please let me know. That concludes my presentation. Uh, when can we ask questions? So next we should take public comment. Um, then we would go to rebuttal. 
ex parte okay. communications and then go into public comment. That would be great. Thanks. Yes. So before public comment, have there been the ex parte communication? Mr. Chard. Uh, yes, I received uh, two letters, uh, one from the neighbor uh, Rick Edick and one from the applicant. And in the applicant's letter, uh, he invited us to take a look at the property. I checked with Michelle as to the appropriateness of this, and she, I believe, checked with the city attorney and said that it was indeed appropriate. So I called the applicant. I went over there uh, yes, uh, today, this afternoon, and uh, had a tour of the, of the facility. None. Yeah, so I also received the emails, letters, and um, I was invited to come tour the property, but I was not able to make it. So I've had no ex parte communication. I also received the emails and I responded because I had seen the property many years ago. Um, and uh, th that's, that's it. Okay, um, public comment. Did Ms. Finn not have any answer. answered? I said none. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. I misheard, sorry. Go ahead, Mr. So Please do. <laughs> Thanks. George Long, 46 North Swinton Avenue. Well, uh, there's 22 pages of staff reports, so I, I, I'm just going to give you a couple of my general impressions, and, and that is... Um, what I see here is what you would call a progression of change that maintains this kind of beachy compound feeling about it, which is a good thing when you look at what's happening around A1A and you see these things that I would, I guess we'd call uh, coastal columned cubes, big squares with a few columns out front overlooking the ocean. This is a great, great thing we have here. Uh, as for the, uh, the, the size of the additions, uh, if you're looking from A1A, I don't see anything at all obtrusive about that. As for the paint color, I'm not going to tell you what color it was, but I know just by looking at it. I, I mean, I, I feel like I do it. And what you need is somebody to do some CSI on that, which would be construction scene investigation, and you could find out what colors were there. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? No, I don't think so. No? Okay, is there a rebuttal or cross examination from staff? Um, I don't have anything based on what the applicant has said in their presentation, but I'd like to hear what they say now. Sounds like the applicant has. Just a, a couple points of reference. Um, you all have in your packets uh, uh, various letters that we've written over the, the months, the, the past eight or nine months, uh, and they're justification statements. They, they go into uh, quite a bit of detail about what we're seeking for each of those letters. And one deals with the waiver, one deals with uh, uh, the variance. Um, and so, so we feel like there's competent and substantial, substantial evidence in those letters that you have before you. Um, and um, we've talked openly and with complete transparency with staff from day one. We're totally willing to uh, add some very subtle uh, delineation on the garage to, to uh, and, and do it administratively with staff uh, to differentiate between uh, the existing two-car garage that's out there today, whether it was original or partially original or not. Uh, and, and distinguish it from the third bay that we're adding. Very easy, basic architectural 101. We can do that. We can easily distinguish uh, with color and texture and with perhaps a very slight recess, uh, the differentiation on the second floor of the rear wing. Uh, I hope you feel like this. There's no question that it's much more supportable and much more subordinate way back there than it would have been on top of the existing garage. Uh, and then uh, the color of the house. Um, it, there's clear evidence that it was, uh, uh, had a heavy whitewash on it. Um, I will say to you, uh, 
of all the historic districts or towns I've ever been in, and, 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 and St. Augustine comes to mind, there's virtually like one home or one building uh, that, you, that you may find that is an unpainted uh, raw structure. And it's like an 1850s kind of a thing. And so I feel that this was never intended to be exposed the way it has become exposed over the years and the decades. Uh, this house is clobbered by uh, saltwater intrusion and the winds of the ocean. And uh, whatever whitewash or, uh, or, or paint that it once had on it, it is long gone. Uh, it, 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 it is, in, in some ways, it, it opens uh, an opportunity for, for much heavier maintenance just to keep up with, with uh, everything that's unfinished. And so we're, we're, you know, we're, we're pleading to you to allow us to return it uh, to a, a much more pristine uh, environment that, uh, than what you see today. Um, and, I'll, and I'll pass it over to Frank and he'll say a couple of other words about. Uh, I'll just be quick. You know, thanks. I think Michelle's presentation was very thorough. If I could just use hers, I, I want to just go to the variance real quick, because she articulated that the you know there isn't this existing variance that's there. Um, I just want to make sure that we're clear, or you're clear. Michelle, it was the image of. Is it the site plan? Yeah, the site plan. Keep going. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Okay. Just <clears throat> so so. So so the part in, and that's hashed, is part of the footprint. This is not an addition to the building. It's an addition from the existing closet to the east over an existing balcony. So there's no add to the footprint. The same thing he, well, the reason we took that balcony off, because I met with my neighbor, that would have been part of the variance. It's no longer part of the variance because it's outside of the 12 feet. So the only piece that's part of the variance is what's here and what's below it that we're enclosing. But it's not an addition. It's not, a, it's not adding more structure that's not already inside that one or toward that one foot uh, setback. Just want to make sure that, that was that was clear. And I think I think questions would be good because um, there's a lot of material here and a lot of time, eight, 16 months worth. For, from a layperson, I just want to say you know we we've done and I'm going to use the word jump through so many hoops to try to honor what's there, but try to evolve to to something that we can enjoy and use today and you know it's not going to stay the way it is as evidenced by all these yellow cards uh, I think we're being extremely sensitive uh, as the gentleman said here I, you know I've built huge houses on the ocean and I, I just think that this these these little red areas are, are going to be as minimal as we can and but yet still be able to enjoy the house so we'd love to answer some questions last two cents on, on, on the variance uh, the entire there's a 12 foot variance on the on the north side of the property line and the, the entire the entire uh, uh, edge of the north side of the existing home is non-conforming uh, so there's non-conforming conditions all along there including the porch of the terrace of the second floor we're, we're taking that terrace and we're capturing the smallest amount of square footage for expanding of, of a master walk-in closet so we're not uh, it's, it's very important to know that the, in, in the variance, in the request of the variance, and in the justification letter of the variance, uh, we're not in seeking uh, an increase in the existing non-conforming conditions, we, which is very important. So, so we're, we're going straight up over an existing flat roof terrace. We're not expanding the footprint. And so uh, it's, it, I just want to make you aware of that and uh, thank you again thank Michelle the other Michelle Katharina and everybody involved the other Michelle is Michelle Hewitt so Hewitt. Um, I just have a quick question 
It's a rebuttal question, I guess. Um, let me go back here. On the, um, just so the board understands too, the ground floor where the addition is, is a terrace now, and that will become a second floor above a terrace, or will the second, the ground floor be enclosed? ground floor the first floor. the entire area that encroaches into the north setback is it inside the house or is it a patio deck it's a combination yes okay so um just to be clear while there is an improvement in that area what the applicant is stating that they're not increasing the ground floor footprint there but they are enclosing the ground floor and the second floor i just wanted to make sure because I understood that, but I didn't. I didn't want to make sure, you know, that you changed something. Use your little clicker and just show what you're talking about because you got the right one. It's that. It's I'm that. talking about that right there. Okay, so that's a terrace right here now. That's there that that's we're not there. enclosing. The only thing's being enclosed is that little square by the fireplace. Go to your left, top right there yes that's the only part that's being brought inside exactly the rest is outside that's what I want the board to understand that there is a combination happening here you have some ground floor enclosure and then a second floor on top of that but yeah the variance, if I'm, the variance is only at the second level not at the first right okay. yes he's correct the variance does already exist for the ground floor it's being asked for for the second floor Okay, that was the only thing I wanted to make sure we were all clear on. So we're done rebutting, I think? Yeah. We're done with rebuttal. We can go into board discussion. We have a lot to unpack here. Um, I just had one quick question for the applicant um, before we really get into the discussion, and that is, I know how much you went through to get that treehouse legalized. And it means so much to you. Why the change of heart? Why, why are you? Why, why have you decided to, to take it down and move it? Well, it is part of the designation. Like we have a COA for that treehouse, so it's, it's you know it's part of the property now. It does mean a lot to me. Um, when we do these additions, that treehouse will impede a tremendous amount of view from the back guest house. And being able to at least keep it as a changing room is better than losing it completely. I appreciate and enjoy everything in my life, but I cling to nothing. So by appreciating it as many years as I have, I'm not going to cling to it in the, in the place that it's at now. I know it's been, you know, when uh, Michelle was here when Amy Alvarez and this all hat went down that it was you know there's a lot of people in the city that were upset about that and I think I think even using her words there was this big sigh when she read that into the record that it's moving uh, so great we'll, we'll, we'll move it we'll, we'll remove it and it makes for a much better elevation now because as as she pointed out you can't see any of this from the road you still to this day other than the treehouse you can't see it from the road so that's that's my answer. I have a treehouse question. Can I follow yeah, up on yeah. that? Okay. Um, what is the treehouse made of? Is it also cypress? So, yes. What we did, um, Claudia, is we took that Fontaine Fox cartoon book. Yes. We scaled it. Yes. And that treehouse looks exactly like the Tunerville trolley. Same roof line, same window in the front. So it's all cypress. It's all cypress. It's all cypress. Has it been sealed or treated in any way? It's just, it, if you look at it from the road, it matches the color of the house now. It does seem to match the color of the house. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That was my treehouse question. <laughs> I, I, my, my point of the treehouse is it's been there for 20 years and now has become actually kind of a landmark. <laughs> on, um, on North Beach. So. I'm sure your ears are burning back there. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I agree, but change happens. You know, I, I love that tree house. I, I, had, I read all, wrote all my books in there, designed the houses in there. My little girl played in there with her, with her friends. But to, when you look at it as, as a whole new design, redesign, it's, it's perfect where it goes by the pool. I mean, I'm, I'm fine with that. 
discussion? Um, I wanted to ask Michelle a question, if I could. Simple, easy questions first. Um, the walkway, there's been talk about this covered walkway, and I see this big walkway uh, shown there, but that's the only, only thing I've ever seen about it. Yeah, the, we don't have drawings for it other than it's on the site plan. So do we, is that part of our approval or it not? It has to be part of the approval, and we did ask, um, or we, I think we included in the staff report, um, that the, did we actually put it in the conditions, or was it something we said that you could add? It, it would have to be a condition. Um, we just don't have the architecture for it, the elevations. Okay. Um. So you would approve, I mean, if it was detrimental to the property, what would, in your staff's opinion, what would happen? Well, at this point, I think it's so far away from the front elevation, um, and it's downstairs on the deck. So I, I don't know that it would be detrimental to the property, but if that's the board's decision to make, and if you need to see it, then you can add that condition. Well, it's kind of hard to decide on something you haven't seen. Yeah. Now, uh, now, notice he has awnings on the side of the garage. Uh, I was curious why you had an awning on the side of the garage now, and if you're going to keep awnings. So um, I know you're posing the question to the applicant, but I'm going to go to the drawing. Okay. That, um, rendering that is in here. I guess I was posing it to you, but you might have to ask the applicant. <laughs> so there is actually a cedar shake. Um, what are you calling that, Roger? Eyebrow. And it, it's an eyebrow, or it's like a shed roof that is going to extend. So what you're asking is this, that awning there. Yes, yes, okay. And, so um, what Mr. McKinney is holding up, I will queue up on the screen so okay. you can see. Okay, so no awning and roof overhang. He's okay. got a little. This is a, like a little, a little shed. Little a cedar, cedar yeah, shake, cedar. but yeah. It's yeah. Okay. an architectural Thank you. Minor detail. Question. It's much bigger than an eyebrow, but it's kind of eyebrowish. What else? I can start off with some, I'm gonna start off with some easy things okay. and then we can build. Um, I did very much study and read the first plans in great detail. I read every, every word of your justification, Roger. Um, and so I do see the changes. So I am happy that it's not over the garage. To me, that was a good change. Uh, that was just to, to fabricate, I mean, to, it just was too, too. But so I think that's a good thing. Um, and also the hyphen, I looked in the Secretary of Interior Standards for playful, transcending, gym-like, but it doesn't talk about those in the Secretary of Interior Standards, but it is being constructed in a way if in the future it can be removed, correct? So that's a good thing, and I like the change on the roof on that also. Um, so I started off with the easy stuff. Y'all want to follow up for a while? I, I just had a couple of questions. That, so on the, on the main house, on the big cable uh, front-facing, east-facing cable, what is that beside the windows? Is that glass? Mm -hmm. Are you talking about the east or the south elevation? Talking about the east elevation. No, no south, I think. Yeah, this is pieces of glass here you're asking oh, about? South, I'm sorry, I'm looking the wrong yeah. way. That, that right there, that's, that's, so that's like a triangular shape, that's all glass on the sides? And we can, yeah. So it's, oh, I think this is the side you're looking at? Yeah. 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 So that, that was all originally, that was all originally glass? Not 1935. 1935. No. Sorry, if you're, if you're asking the applicant, if you just would right. go up to the. Up to the applicant. 
Um, just for records purposes, that's this side of the house here, the 34 permits on top, the 71 is on the bottom. So that was modified in 71. Oh, okay. I do have a question. So it's not is right. that gable getting bigger? Are you taking it off and making it bigger? Is it the same exact thing from here to here? From where to where? From here, this is the existing? It's the exact same gable, same angle. Nothing's being removed and replaced here, except the fact that you're adding this little window little on top? Window. Correct. This is the scale didn't look right to me on this drawing. Mm -hmm. I, think it does, I think it doesn't look right because it's, it's been drawn east, easterly. So mm -hmm. it appears bigger, but it's, it's the exact, it's, it's, you know, Benjamin, it's an odd window. My best guess is inside that window, there are two planters. Yes. That when we bought the house, people had plants growing in there. And that was the way that they brought sun into these, these two planters that have this tile bottom. It is, it's, that, was, that was part of, part of Bob Curry's? Yes. Um, yeah. Version? Yeah. And, if, if and it looks very, sorry, Roger, it looks very 70s yeah. when you're in there because I, I did see those planters and I said, what is this? They almost look like they could be koi ponds. They are little areas to each side of the door as you go to exit out here. Um, it's very odd. I, I, not until today did I know that Bob Curry made renovations to the house. So that's fascinating. So. Uh, but it's also worth noting that uh, that Volk, uh, re back to these eyebrows and canvas awnings, Claudia, he referred to them in the original 1935 drawings as solar panels. So he gave them a very fancy name, uh, uh, and, and uh, we assume they've been canvas all these years. Uh, but they're solar panels, and in the case of the one along the garage, there aren't any windows below it <laughs> except for one, so it's kind of a weird little element. I think it's kind of... Kind of cool. It's quirky, can, but we want to. Yeah, if we can honor keep it. Bob Curry's, you know, yes, addition to the absolute house as well. Okay, back to Michelle. The question. So things that happened in 1970, um, since this is not a district with an area of significance, um, and this is individually designated, and was de designated historic after that, are are they also considered? Historic now, 70? Yes. So that is one of the standards over time as your additions age. Huh? It makes us all feel old, right? That... Additions do sure. age in as well. So um, 1971's right at that threshold. Okay, okay. Did I say a couple things? Sure. Okay. Um, first of all, I want to compliment the staff on, on this effort. Even though it's only 22 pages, I'm sure there are many, many other pages and hours that you, you and your staff have put together on this, and it was all abundantly clear and, and laid out nicely. The, the second thing is, I would not understand this had I not done the tour of the, the property, because it does have all the angles and the, the various buildings and levels and so forth. Uh, so uh, thanks for allowing me to walk around your property. Um, the, my first question is, and I, I want to direct this to uh, uh, Roger Cope, is concerning these two proposed conditions that are basically around uh, the garage and second floor in the guest wing, what would you propose to be the fine tuning that you would do for the distinctions that, that uh, d distinguish between old and new? Well, let's take the, that's a very good question. Take the garage. That's the easiest example. Shard, may, maybe we re. Yeah, I think Michelle's going to do that. The, the most likely thing to do is to recess the new bay six inches or eight inches or a foot uh, back from the plane of the two car garage. So, so now we know that this two car garage is not the original garage. And a portion of it's not even the original garage. If Michelle is correct, and the garage were the original single car garage were way in the back, uh, it it brings new light to how we would differentiate uh, uh, this. And so it's very subtle sh recess back. Uh, the, the face of the the, uh, the third bay would 
know, go back a foot at the most because we've got to have an adequate depth inside the garage. Um, and then uh, I just start because we haven't discussed this, but but because Jim was there today, some people collect art. I love trees. I had a botanist and arborist come out and date some of the trees on our property over a hundred years old. There is that sea grape that yeah. is right yes. right on the corner. No, I'll take it. Yeah, it's right at the corner of the existing garage. There's a massive sea grape that's about 70 years old that is right wow that's super yeah intense. there right there yeah. right be, right at the edge of the existing two-car garage so in order to keep that which you asked me that question today are you going to keep that the answer is yes because that trunk is just just it's, it's like a piece of art that's where mm -hmm. that's where we would mm -hmm. recess the garage mm -hmm. push it back so we were able to keep that and that would separate it that sea grape would be a really neat differentiator between what mm -hmm. was and what will be. Mm -hmm. Work around the tree. Okay, so same roof line, just recessed. Uh, yes, I'd keep this, the, the, the roof plane on the, the same roof plane as that of the existing. If you start different, if you start dropping it a little bit lower, you get flashing problems, uh, all kinds of things kind of come into play. Uh, if you would rather see the, uh, the the solar panel across the front go back to a canvas awning rather than a cedar shake, I think we'd be amenable to that. That's up uh, to your purpose. We, maybe we do a different garage uh, door design than the two. Uh, you know, I'm just going to say that tree where it is is a perfect break point. It is. It really is. You, I, I saw the tree in the photograph, so yeah. I was wondering about that as well. <laughs> so, so that's your long answer to the garage so to for the second floor of the rear wing to the back which is in the center of that image um personally i see the i see a light semi-transparent whitewash finish on that entire upper level uh and with a uh, a heavy solid non-transparent finish below so the finish uh technique and the painting would be uh, something that we would hang a hat on. I, I'm really understanding uh, Michelle's observation uh, of the possibility of the ex original garage way back there. And so uh, at one time, uh, if Frank and Neil so remember, uh, I, I did have a little gable over that little element uh, uh, to make an homage to what exists today. And uh, we, we thought about it for 15 seconds, we took it away and maybe it needs to come back. So just subtle little things like that, uh, Mr. Shard, that can. So I, I guess in, in, in summary, you would be in agreement with the two conditions. Yes, sir. Perhaps why a different uh, wording, perhaps, yeah. but okay. We're, we're, we're in agreement with the two conditions that are in the report, as well as the uh, third edition uh, or condition that uh, she and Katharine pointed out that in terms of the, the north and south elevations of that wing. We'll, we'll absolutely develop those and provide those. As well as the uh, elevation on the walkways? Absolutely. Okay. Can I address that to you, Claudia, the walkway? So the walkway, the covered walkway from the garage to the main house is if you're coming home with, with groceries and it's raining, right now my wife's getting wet, there's no sides to it, it's minimal height, flat roof, it's not even pitched, flat. and the minimum number of supports to hold the weight. I know it's not in there. There's no visual, yeah. and we'll have to add yeah. it. But no, that's it's what just we there's a lot already going on. That's why I, you have a lot of moving parts, <laughs> so that's why I just thought, well, this is another element, and so I was curious. But you know, I understand its purpose. And, yeah. So the other thing I'd like to address is big elephant in the room, which is the uh, whitewash. And I know uh, Claudia wanted to start with the easy questions. I'll just jump into that one. Uh, obviously, it changes the, I, I want to be careful how I say this, it, it, it really does change the appearance of the whole compound. And uh, I understand, and, and when I walked around today, you could see in lots of places, not just under the eave that was in the picture, flecks of, of uh, white. Now. Was that a whitewash? I don't know. I'm not a painter or an architect, but it, it certainly looked like if 
you were walking around the compound and looking at some of those buildings that there were other indications that there was whitewash at one time. And I, I don't know how to address that. I think the best picture that, that wasn't in Michelle's presentation that is in Roger's handout is the day of the Wilson's wedding. <laughs> Over the top of their head by the front door is a really good, clear picture. And that was in 19, uh, boy, when did they get married? 1990, 91 or something like that, of what the house looked like. And I asked them point blank, in that, in that package, is this what, yes, Frank, that was the original color. I asked, can I introduce that into the record? Yes, you can. So the gentleman who, who, who referred to this CSI, you know, this construction, what was the? Investigation. There you go. Yeah, I, I, I begged them, can you go back in your files and find other pictures? And he, he didn't have any elevations of the house other than that one on their wedding day. And what I showed you under the eaves and those other little places today. So we're, what we proposed originally in, in the application was an actual paint. And that would defeat the purpose of allowing the character of the, of the cypress to be appreciated. So coming off the paint, and coming to the whitewash, once we add on, as Claudia said, all these different moving parts, that whitewash will homogenize the look. If we don't do something to it, it's going to be impossible. It'll look like a leopard. And the tra uh, Roger, the degree of transparency of the whitewash, is there a number, like with, with shade cloth? You, you get, I, I've never done this before. I've, I've never, <laughs> with, you know. The, Believe it or not, in the big, gigantic, thick manual that uh, Michelle referenced earlier, there's, a, there's like 180 pages of painting and what to do, what not to do, and how to scrape it, how to clean it. I don't know what painting techniques were used back then, whether they had limestone in them or, or, or what, but we'll do research on historic painting techniques. I, I don't know how to answer the question. I, I, it'll be a... It'll, be uh, something that we're just going to have to bring in a, a specialist on, perhaps, and and trust me, we'll work with staff. We we will not. We, we'll do a big sample panel out there and do variations of it, and we'll all huddle around and say, you know, where do we go? What what do we do? What looks the best? What represents uh, a finish that we may have had back then? And we'll make a collective decision. Well, I, I just. If I can say something, I don't want to interrupt, but yeah, no. may I? Please. Um, there are a lot of different techniques when it comes to the treatment of wood. Now, the first thing to address is that there is a stain on the property, on the buildings now. So that's going to have to be treated, whether it's removed, sanded, or stripped. It, there's very specific guidance in how that gets done in the Secretary of the Interior Standards. So I think the board may want to see a sample, because I know I would, but I'm not the decision maker here. I'm merely here to help analyze and provide guidance to the applicant on the process. Um, but I know that there's also pickling. There's some other methods to achieve what they're trying to achieve. And I am looking at this photograph here that the applicant submitted, which I did see. And to me, this does have, you know, a lighter color tone to the wood than what we see today. Oh, gosh. What we see today, right? We see a very warm color on the house. We're here, we were seeing a very um, cool color. So I don't know if that was a stain or if that was fading of the wood because in a later photograph that they've provided a small picture of here, um, the wood to me looks patinaed there. It doesn't look like it's treated. So it's, it's really hard to see because I'm looking at a little tiny corner of the house here. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that their goal is to lighten the house up and that you should, you know, if you want to engage that idea, you should ask for a sample. It's Okay, I, I, I have a problem with it. <laughs> The Secretary of Interior Standards is clear that you should not paint unpainted wood. Uh, uh, so I do have a problem with that. And I, that's why I was asking about the treehouse. The treehouse seems to be near the same color. Do, 
I don't have a problem with the new additions being washed, but you know, you would have, as Frank said, you would have to, you know, work to, to get the right color. But I do have a problem with that. Uh, and while I'm talking about the real elephant in the room, I have problems with the massing. I, I just feel like uh, our duty here, really, uh, you know, Roger's duty is to his applicant, but our duty here is to the historic structure. And I feel like Fontaine Fox would be shocked if he saw the, this presentation, this digital present presentation. And yes, it's had changes and changes um, over the years, but how much can we keep changing a historic house? I think it's our duty to make sure, Frank said that it won't be here in 86 years, it's 86 years old or whatever, and he said it just won't be here. It won't, but it's our duty to make sure it's here and as in pure a form as we can while allowing them to, yes, do all kinds of things to the inside, but the outside, I think we have to stick to the Secretary of Interior Standards. We have to uh, do as minimal as we can. I do not believe it makes something subordinate by putting it to the rear. I believe that means it's recessed, but I still think it is not subordinate. So when I look at the basic uh, rules that we're supposed to follow, I have trouble with those. And while I'm at it, I have trouble with all of the windows <laughs> because one of the things that Secretary and Chair Standards and our design guidelines are about cutting new openings and changing windows. And we're, we're, there are so many changes to the windows. I tried to make a list of them here, but I, I really couldn't. Now, I understand the need to switch to hurricane. So I, I wouldn't fight that on, uh, by any means. Um, but there's just a lot going on that I don't think has to go on. Um, and so I would, I would like to see it, uh, you know, I would like to see it worked on. Does the master closet really have to be so large that they have to get a variance? I mean, we're talking one foot. So um, I would be for a little downsizing. And I, I think that's sort of my basic points. <laughs> I've been really quiet. I've just been listening. Um, I, I was going to ask about the windows as well. Um, I know a lot of the changes looks like, in my opinion, some of the changes were made in the 70s because obviously the original structure you know, was added on and that sort of thing. And from the exterior, some of the windows, like you said, they're kind of, don't look like they make sense at all, kind of, like they're where they are. So my question would be, it's not, if, if they did the changes in the 70s and added the windows, like, um, we allow certain changes to be made to the windows or you want to keep it the exact way that it is right well I'm, I'm no I mean there's there's some give and take within reason to to help them modernize this right. but I just it, it was it's hard to keep up with everything I, I particularly don't like the little window above the uh, peak because as Michelle maybe it's an optical illusion but as she pointed out that doesn't look it, it looks larger but maybe it's because of the little transom window above. But there are walls that have no windows, and maybe that's because of the desired interior use, but it's not usually our uh, purview to, to allow changes to an exterior because of what they want to do on the in interior. Um, So uh, it's it's a complete it's a completely different house in in this plan from it is so far from Fontaine Fox house 
And I did go to that house, your house, many years ago, and I thought it was magical. And I loved the pots, and I loved the wood, uh, and of, of course the, the canopy was always fabulous. But where is where is that in the in this drawing? Um, are you asking a question, or are you in discussion? Uh, no, that was sort of a esoteric kind of question, <laughs> not a real question. Um, do you want to hear from the applicant, I guess, is what I'm getting at, or are you in board discussion? I was trying to discuss with my colleagues. That, that's, that's, who I, that's why I didn't really mean to address other people during that. I was just trying to have a board discussion. Okay. If, I, if I'm understanding, you feel like the, the proposed design has kind of lost the, lost the spirit, lost the... I mean, I, and I, I don't know if that's a function of massing or, or not, but you know, the, that's, that's the challenge for the architect, right? To, to be able to, to make changes and not, not, lose the, not lose the spirit of the, the original structure. I just think it's had so many changes over the years, including changes to the lots so some of these uh, conditions are self-created by you know the way the the lots were changed and replatted but um i i just think it's a little too much and i would like to see I, i'm not trying to design it but it would be less massive to me more subordinate if that wasn't a straight wall on that uh, the north side, if, if the second story didn't come all the way over. Um, and on some of the views, and, and I'm, I'm not really sure if it was the west or whatever, it just, the, the, the roof looks so top heavy on what I believe is the east side, which is the side that's to the street. But my, uh, view on this is not really how it's viewed from the street. It's s saving the historic structure. I mean, I know I use Lincoln's Log Cabin a lot, but how, how much can you keep changing Lincoln's Log Cabin to modernize it before you lose the historic structure? Could I ask Mich Michelle a question? And it, it really relates to your issue on windows. And I think I think it was on the west elevation. Um, it, it appeared that currently it was sort of a hodgepodge of windows, different sizes and different locations. And when when I look at visual compatibility standards, it talks about rhythm uh, and that uh, the rhythm of the solids to the voids. And I just like you to, if you could, expound upon that a little bit as to whether Rhythm is with hodgepodge, or rhythm is what with what what Roger proposed. The intent of rhythm to solids to voids is so that you don't have. Um, first of all, those visual compatibility standards we apply to individually designated properties and properties that are in a district. When it's a property in a district, we're applying the standards right. for a house to all of the other houses and styles of what's the predominant style and district because every district does have architectural styles. That doesn't styles. pertain here. Here we're looking at what's the predominant style of this property and these structures and what we are having here is um, a wall as you see on the top that has six window openings. Five of them are identical and one is a little bit different than the other and those are all being removed and switched over on the ground floor to a single hung window um, with no windows on the top floor. So now we start to have an issue about rhythm to solids to voids because do we really have rhythm in solids to voids for all of the other sides of the house? If you look here, we have a very defined window pattern that's happening here, right? And it's mimicked on the second floor, which is not a recommended approach. There's a window on the ground floor that's being modified from it's 1960-ish style. Um, that doesn't look like what we're seeing on the back, right? And Can you go to the back? 
I'm sorry. I'm going to have to ask you to sit while we're in discussion unless the board poses a question, which I'm sure they will. Um, here. I'm not going to sit. I'm going to stand. That's fine. I just... Yeah. Um, here we can see, you know, a very similar window pattern that's existing. It's a slight shift by adding a window with the addition. This is a 2013 edition, and they're going to shift those windows. They aren't unlike windows that are used in the rest of the house. But then when we go back to that rear, I feel like I keep losing it here. It's this one there's no fenestration pattern happening on that second floor so yes there could the board could say that there's an, an issue with a rhythm to solids to voids here or you could say that you find this is acceptable really at what point when we were doing the review did we we were doing a review trying to address the most important things that were happening on the property and there's so much Right, and that's what you all need to deliberate on and communicate with the applicant about changes as you've done thus far. Claudia, I just so we can have good discussion because okay. we are talking about the windows. Like in that the top one, me, with the way the windows are, it just it seems more out of balance or out of. And again, I don't know if that was 2013 or it was the 1970s or when those windows were added or you know what was the, are, the are you bottom talking here up top on the very the, the existing i'm sorry the existing rear west elevation um right in see how it, the window is like there and then i guess it's still those windows are going to remain but the addition is going to be in front of it so you won't really see that is that what the red is so what i'm is illustrating she had said to Claudia, so I just want to make sure she's addressing that question to staff, or are yes, you I'm okay. sorry, yes, Michelle, can okay. you answer okay. that? Okay. Thank you, Kelly. Right. Sorry, I'm sorry. Um, so the form of the back of the house is not changing. It's the openings and roof that's changing right here. So this, there's no real addition okay. happening in this okay. space. It's okay. changing the elevation. Um, so that part of the house all remains the same this other color red over here is what's being added um i i assume the reason there are no windows on the top level is because of their interior desires uh, for usage um so second floor plan here it's Sorry, I'm just going to make the same comment. Was that question addressed to staff or the applicant? I addressed that. You? I'm sorry. I, okay. I addressed that to Michelle. I'm okay. sorry. Thanks. Um, and the applicant certainly could engage on this comment here because this is a solid wall, that staircase and hallway, so that to me, I don't know that it, there couldn't be windows there. But you may want to specifically ask them if you're looking at giving them some direction. Um, Certainly, maybe you, know, you have a shower here, staircase here, and then a long hall, bedroom. Was that a question directed to the applicant? Uh, the board would need to ask the applicant if they would like to. I, I don't mean to step on Claudia's toes, but I think that's the question. I think it's a question. I, I, I think it's, it's encompassed in an, in an overall concern that I have with the second floor addition on the guest wing. Is It goes back to the, the conditions of making that, doing some type of treatment administration on that second floor to make it look less uniform and make it look subordinate to the original structure uh, in in doing that I think that that, um, that the designer could do something with with windows or some other type of treatment to make that look a little so it's not like such a blank wall Michelle can I ask you a question I think in the original your original presentation you had pointed out the gable 
that was there and, and possibly the way, um, and, and I heard Roger mention that was, they kind of played around with that and they took it out, but they could possibly add it back. Um, it's that gable there that you see. I don't know why we're zooming in. Oh, did I fix it? Oh, I did. Um, it's this gable right here. And as I heard Mr. Pope say that they did discuss, you know, keeping that and that there might be some possibility for keeping that on the, um, the elevation here. Which would be um, oops, bringing that down somehow into this area. Um, I do, I did hear the applicant note about differentiating through the use of paint and exterior paint treatment. That's not usually the way it's, it's approached. It's more of, because paint can be painted over in 10 years from now and then we lose it all. So just something to consider. I, th I think my, my overall concern is particularly with that guest wing is, is just that it's, you know, right now, this, this property is a, is several funky little buildings that have all been kind of cobbled together. And now the, the treatment of this guest wing makes it look like one homogenous building. And, and, and we lose that, that whole feel of, of, of what's there now of, of several small buildings. I don't have an issue so much with with the second floor addition. I just just the way that it's being done to make it look like it's you know it was all built at one time, make it look like it's one building. I, I think that's what I have more problem with. What do you think about the second story master addition? I'm addressing Ben. Yeah. Um, <laughs> on the main house. Yeah. I don't like the peaks on those on those two windows. It looks like twin spires of Churchill Downs. To yeah, me. they don't look like they belong. I, I, again, this is something that I, I, I'm not so troubled with the massing or the addition as I am just the contemporary look of of those of those two dormers. I feel like we've just enclosed the whole. You gotta go. You gotta go through an extra new layer of house to get back to the what was historic. I just, I just. It's a great house. I would like to see the historic. One of the other things we haven't talked about. We talked about the windows and the change of the windows, but we haven't talked about the colors of the window frames and the door frames. I've seen pictures, they look like they're green, and then the pictures look now on the existing home that they're kind of a periwinkle blue. blue or something, but um, Michelle, that's something in staff you'll have to review is, is the color of the window frames? Well, I mean, if the house is going to stay brown. Yeah, that's the issue. And the windows are now blue framed. I don't know if they were blue framed originally or green framed. It was probably not likely that at the time this thing was built that they had cypress window frames. So I wouldn't, I would believe that the window frames were probably treated in some way, probably with paint. So it might have had green framed windows back then or blue, I don't know. But the Secretary of the Interior Standards talks about not changing the finish of the frame of the window. It says that in there. That's where the glass color comes in, the reflectivity and all of that. So the proposal, I think, what they're at now is white. Did you start at bronze? No, you were always at white framed windows. So a white frame window, if the house stays brown, that's still providing some differentiation. Um, but I, I honestly don't know what to say about that because I'm stuck back here on this thing because this is coming forward. This is changing. And I just want to be really clear that I did ask that question. This whole thing here, 
that's coming forward of the the east side of the structure. So the the little gable that you see here becomes hidden in behind this. So that's not maintaining the original, that's replicating the original and bringing it forward east. I'm sorry, I misunderstood that when the applicant said it, but then I asked for clarification, so. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to see that recessed back. Um, and as far as the, the color, it, it all depends on the way the house goes. I think it looks great with the blue, fine with the green. The white, if they were gonna paint it, seems more appropriate, but um, I don't, you know, that's, I'm, I'm okay with whatever on this house. But if it becomes a whitewashed house, uh, yeah, I, so I'm not for whitewashing it. <laughs> the only area that I, I've seen that looks like it has a wash on it is under the eaves. I could, you know, the, if you want to whitewash under the eaves, but. Um, I don't, I, the others just look like weathered cypress in some of my old 1939 and 1937 houses. They, you know, it fades out that color. Um, I, I can only feel like the outside has had some treatment, but. So what can we do? We um, we want to we want to give the applicant some some ideas, some direction to we can if we can uh, get this to where but we can have something that we can improve. Yeah, I think as we've done before, if if you guys are leaning toward a continuation with direction, if you just give the applicant an opportunity to say whether you know they prefer a continuation with direction or they'd rather you just make a decision um, tonight. If you could just come to the podium. Are, yeah, are you asking him or? We're, we're asking the applicant, yes. Okay, sorry. I guess we'd be okay to continue with direction, but I, I'm not hearing any specific direction. I, I'm hearing windows here and colors there and you know, I mean, if we had all night to go around the house to show you what windows really are changing and what aren't changing, I just don't know what to come back to you with. And and, and so, I mean, I, one, one board member says basically she just wants to keep it the way it is. Yep, we need to enhance our house. It's been it, it's been through a lot of changes. Been through so, two changes since we've owned it in 25 years. So they they will once they make the motion, they'll actually lay out what they're talking about with the direction so um if that helps you it would help are they going to place the windows for me like, i i don't really it's really hard if it was like we don't want the color or we want the garage to be set apart that's that's doable and, and so the board's not here they're, they're not going to actually design it but they will give you some direction on you know how t they believe that it should fit more into the interior guidelines or the LDRs or um, so it'll be somewhat general and then you'll bring it back to the board to have it reviewed um. we, we have not formulated our, our direction yet that's that's yeah. the idea is we want to try to give you direction so that you and, and Roger can work on this and, and, and bring back something that we're we're all all happy with because we want you to be able to do what you want to do we just have to be able to do it in a way that that meets all the criteria okay i'll say once again I'd, i don't design it but i'd like to see some reduction in the massing of the upstairs addition the forward addition on the east side i uh, would like it to be recessed and set back or some if possible and also the massing on the um, the guest cottage 
I just think it should be subordinate. That's what the rules say. That's, that's the guidance I'm giving. Just follow the rules that it should be subordinate. Kristen? Jim? We, we've talked about um, basically five different conditions, um, which I assume from what I, I heard from Kelly, we could put under A, uh, move to continue with direction. Uh, and there is agreement on some of them, I believe. Uh, certainly, uh, I think the garage one is fairly straightforward. I think there's probably a majority or a consensus on, on that one. And the architect spoke uh, to uh, how he'd address it. Uh, so that, that could be, uh, if we wanted to take an action of uh, continuing with direction, that could be definitely one direction. Uh, the guest wing gets a little troublesome. Uh, we, we have talked about uh, <clears throat> uh, some of the, uh, the, uh, the gable on the first floor is one thing. Uh, perhaps we could give direction there that they could look at the uh, massing and, and come back with suggestions on that. I'm not troubled by the massing on that so much. I, I'm not entirely clear what subordinate really means when you get down to square footages and so forth. Um, so that could be a, a second one. A third one um, could be uh, the, the window treatment on the west um, elevation of the guest house. Um, Another could be the covered walkway elevations, which I think they've already agreed to. Uh, and with regard to colors, coming back with various samples without near basically making the decision as to what they are, that they could give us some alternatives. I, I, I would say one thing that I noticed in my walk around is when, because of weather conditions, the wood has to be replaced, you do get kind of this spotted leopard effect uh, that some of the wood over here is one color and over here is another color. And I think that the, I believe that perhaps the whitewash might make that a much more consistent, homogenous uh, color. So the, uh, those are the ones that I heard. At that, and um, you know, we, we want to understand the ideas for the window frame colors, right. and if there's uh, trim colors. I mean, I, I'm thinking windows and doors, um, but maybe the doors are all glass here. Um, you, you know, trim colors like railings and some things like that. Just, just understand what what the ideas are there. And for me, the biggest thing is that that guest house in that second floor of the guest house to be subordinate and um, wh whatever that means. What does that mean? <laughs> Can you direct that as a question to me? Um, sure. So that making that subordinate is, is his job. It's really to come up with a design that we can bring back to you that will show that we've given our best effort to make that subordinate. The windows on the west, I just want to say why there are no windows. That's the hallway, and it looks right at the neighbor's property. It looks right down at him, and he looks right into that hallway. So that's why, other than one window on the west elevation, I don't know how my clicker's going, but that's why there's only one on that side. It's a privacy thing. So some of the other windows on the west you know, Claudia, when you were saying it, the, the existing, those are single hung. I just don't think he drew them right. They're, those are single hung on the bottom, and they were going to be single hung on the top. Yeah. They just look a little, like little squares, but they're, I open them up. That's my wife's office. Yeah, so the existing on the top, those single hung on the bottom that are proposed are exactly, those three are all single hung. They're just drawn to be squares. 
and, and again, that re the, the missing windows on the second floor, if you were to stand up there, his house, his bedroom, is, it's just, just right there. So I met with him, and we agreed that would be the best thing to do. And that looks at nothing other than his house. There's, there, that's not viewable. For, even a bird couldn't see that because it's so heavily landscaped. You walk back there today, Jim, you, you can't see any of that. So that landscaping doesn't uh, provide a protection privacy screen from the neighbor? Not enough. That, where that window is on the second floor, there's a huge sea grape, the proposed window on the second floor. There's a huge sea grape right in front of that. So there we could put one. Yeah. Can I use it again, or can you point at it? It's that, yes, that window right, keep going to your left. That window right there has a huge sea grape in front of it. The other one's, there's some arecas that are on his side that are not tall enough. But I think the general direction of let's let's rework some windows, let's come in with some. We did have a, a piece okay. of sand. Uh, so, I, I think you have answered that question, unless okay. you guys still have further questions for him. I was just trying to summarize what I, you I could address that for one more or sentence or two. I mean, I understand your reason for now that you're explaining about the windows because. Uh, the, the landscape buffer, even though it's huge, according to Roger, is not huge enough when it comes to having a neighbor. Um, but still, you know, it's a hallway. It's not into the bedroom or whatever. And we're not supposed to design the exterior of the house for the interior. I mean, for, I don't know. I just think if you somehow broke that up a little bit, S somehow, and um, you're you, maybe you're going to have to use blinds for some of the somebody walking down the hallway or something. Uh, but it could use it could use something. I know that Roger can come up with some interesting way. Yes, Michelle. I think you're right. The, the maybe it's not a window treatment. Maybe it's a different treatment. It's an architectural detail or something that's done. Yes, in design. It, it could be an architectural treatment. Jill, could you show us the aerial so that, that we can see? Because that, that, that parcel has a really strange shape on the west side. Yeah, and I remember that too from being out there. I remember it wasn't this area that I was in where I peeked over a hedge, but I this, did this see the pool. That other house seems very there, close There, that's the one. I did see the pool in this area, so I'm gonna flip back and forth, Mr. Chard, if you don't mind, because there's this one here. And this is the house that um, Mr. McKinney's referencing. And then this is the um, landscape area here where there's, I think, arecas and other trees. Um, but this is all heavily landscaped between that corner there. This here, we walk down. You have to walk down a staircase. And then you get down into this area here that I can just imagine must have been so much fun for their daughter to play back there and climb trees. But it's very heavily wooded, um, mature trees that are back in here. So this is the area that we're looking at for right. the addition, and that's that house. Um, is there any other direction? Because I was trying to diligently record everything that the board said, which fortunately we do have video recordings of these, so it's easy enough to go back and listen. Is, is there more direction before you move to a motion? Are, are you good there? I'm good. I'm good. Do you want me to just repeat what I had heard you guys say. Um, so I heard recess and setback garage, reduced massing of guest cottage to be subordinate, um, window treatment on west elevation, covered walkway elevation, um, colors providing various samples, and then the window frame trim colors. Did I capture everything? No. <laughs> okay. I heard Claudia say reduction in massing on the east side of the main structure and the east side of the guest house needs to be subordinate. Mr. Chard, Jim, you said garage designed to honor the progression of change, which is going to be a result of this change. Guest wing is troublesome, gable on first floor, 
would be good. You're not bothered by its massing. Add window treatments on the west elevation of the guest house. Covered walkway elevations. Provide exterior samples. Determine window frame colors and railings was Ben. Second floor of guest house needs to be subordinate. Um, Claudia said windows are some detailing on the west elevation. And some of those are overlapping, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, then there are some minor things which they've already agreed to make changes to that are in the staff report. And I would suggest this would be a great time to address those items too. Just minor site plan technical items. So, yeah. You want to do a motion? We do have... Um, you can continue with what Michelle said, I guess, or Michelle's summary, or Kelly and Michelle's summary. Um, I, I move to continue with direction uh, based on the summarization that was provided by Michelle Hoyland. That's fine. No. Sorry. And Kelly Brandon also. Okay. Ah. And Kelly Brand. Sorry. I second. <laughs> Call the roll. Jim Charn? Yes. Stop. Claudia Willis? Yes. Sorry, it looks like we need just a quick clarification of the mo motion. Can I guys stop you guys right Can here? I stop the and ask a quick question it just occurred to me we have a variance so do we want to do a date certain is there a date certain that the applicant and michelle can agree to that might work for you guys um otherwise it's a re-advertisement so we'll be ready next month we'll, we'll just bring our best efforts on all, all so the stuff i'm hearing we'll to do be our on best and next, give it one more try to be on next month you have to submit on friday we won't be ready by Friday. So it's a two month, a two month delay. January. Otherwise you can re-advertise. I mean, I, I think. Can I ask a, a question? I'm sorry that I stopped this, but I think it was imperative. If they continue to the December meeting and the applicant isn't ready or we aren't to the point where it's ready to go, can they come to that meeting and say, we're not ready, can you continue again? Mm -hmm. why yes, don't, they can. Why don't we do that? That way, if you work your butt off over the weekend and say, hey, I can get you something on Monday. No, not that. Can't get any of it. Like, for example, we did have a, can I? I mean, she just, can sure. I? Yeah. So we had a sample of Cypress I wanted to bring in. Overnight it was perfect. Last year it was perfect. Overnight it was yellow. So we didn't. I mean, we could bring stuff like that and knock some of these things off once we understand what they are. Because if you're sitting here, I'm, are you clear exactly what I'm supposed to be doing? I, I'm not clear. So we'll do our best by Friday to, to, to get you something so that we can come in and start to check off some of these items. And then if they have to continue again, they can continue at that meeting to another date certain. Sure, you can set it to the December meeting and then um, it can be continued again at that, at that meeting for a date, or postponed to the, the date certain, so. Um, okay. Thank you for letting me interrupt. I just wanted to make sure we knew what we were doing there. So do you need to revise the motion to say December? Yeah, and do you have the exact date? December 1st. Okay, so if you just amend the motion to, um, to add the 
Um, um, yeah, I amend my motion as previously stated with the addition of uh, scheduling a date certain on December 1st. Second. Call the roll. Jim Chard? Yes. Claudia Willis? Yes. Kristen Finn? Yes. Benjamin Baffer? Yes. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks. Good luck. See y'all next time. And the changes were good from the last one, so you can do it. Thank you. Have a great night. Does he get you get your glasses? Okay, um, next item on the agenda was 8A and is now 8B, is 201 Northeast 5th Court. COA 2021-267 is the file entered into the record. Mr. Ron Brito is here to represent the owner and will present to the board now. So you can use keys, mouse, or the clicker. Okay. Name and address, please. Good evening. My name is Ron Brito uh, with Enterprise Contractors. Uh, my, my address is 2559 Web Avenue, uh, suite number two in Delray. Uh, I'm representing uh, Brochelle Greenberg for 201 Northeast uh, 5th Court. Uh, basically what we're doing is uh, we've, uh, we, did, we, we remodeled the house uh, last year, year before, and uh, she, bought, she wanted to get a uh, golf cart. And we put a golf cart uh, garage in her uh, uh, accessory building. And since she's been living there, she's, uh, she's kind of changed her mind on golf carts and thinks they're too dangerous to be driving. So she wants to eliminate the golf cart garage door and raise the, raise the floor. Uh, what she does inside, she's going to raise it inside and turn it into a, uh, an art studio, uh, more, more room for her art studio. So basically what we're going to be doing is just closing up the... Uh, uh, the golf cart uh, opening, removing the door, making it a, a straight wall across the front. Uh, the colors are going to be matching the existing, and that's about the long and short of it. I don't know if have, have any of you had a chance to go by there and see that or. It's pretty obvious. Let me, let's see if I can see. Is it ready to do X part? Uh, Where's Michelle? Right. Uh, the accessory building is right, right here. And her golf cart uh, garage is right there. Goes in, over, and back. We're just taking out the garage door and closing that wall up. So that'll be a straight wall going across. Uh, let's see if there's any pictures. This is the uh, golf cart garage right there, I believe. This is the door that's coming out right there. That'll be a straight wall going across. You can see it a little bit better right there, where it says garage. That garage door will be closed off. The inside elements, we're just going to raise the floor up and take part of a wall out and make that uh, studio a little bit bigger for her. There's a picture of the golf cart garage. Her garage is staying the same. 
So we're just removing the garage door. And that's a picture of the garage door. In between those two lights, it'll be solid wall. Pretty simple request. Are, are you finished with that? Yep. Okay, then I, I think we need staff to come forward. Um, so tonight is Michelle Hewitt's first night presenting to the board, so I'm going to help assist. Would you please um, pose the question that you have here? We were just moving on to staff presentation. Oh, I thought there was a question here. Okay, so do you need, do you know how to go to the presentation? Okay, let me just go there. Thank you for your patience. So you will introduce yourself, your name, and position title, mm -hmm. and then you can roll through using this, this, or this. Mm -hmm. That's the spotlight function, should you need to use it. Mr. Brito, if you want to sit just while they go ahead and give the presentation. Thank you. Um, good evening. Uh, for the record, I'm Michelle Hewitt, um, Historic Preservation Planner. Um, is there anything else I need to read in terms of like getting started into here? Okay, great. Um, so the item before the board is a consideration of a certificate of appropriateness request for the removal and closure of a garage door on the front of the non-contributing accessory structure for the structure property located at 201 Northeast 5th Court. So the subject property outlined in red is located between Northeast 2nd Avenue and Northeast 5th Avenue on the east and west and Northeast 5th Terrace and Northeast 5th Court on the north and south. Um, the structure itself was built in 1948 and currently contains a one-story single-family residence in the mason masonry vernacular style. In addition, a detached accessory structure that contains a garage and guest space both structures are classified as non-contributing to the historic district. The garage and guest house along with an addition was approved in November of 2018. And earlier this year, the installation of a screen porch enclosure on the front of the garage and guest cottage was approved as well. Um, so here we have a um, view of the front facade or the west elevation of the property. Um, on the right is the main structure and on the left is the accessory structure. And within the circle is kind of, um, is the garage um, doors um, that you can see. So here is a site plan. Um, the, uh, it shows the main structure in the middle and to the Northeast is the accessory structure. Got the property line there as well. So looking closer um, at the garage, the existing plan shows the cottage space or the craft space to the left um, uh, or west highlighted in blue and the uh, garage space to the right highlighted in green. Um, the garage space is separated um, with the um, single car garage um, being for the golf cart um, in the middle and then on the right is the uh, two car garage. Um, that's illustrated a little bit better here. Um, so the red is the um, going to be where the proposed um, closure of the single car garage um, delineated in the red, the solid red line. Um, and then uh, on the left, um, still the guest cottage and the right is the space where the double car garage is. So this um, is what the proposed garage plan will look like. The single garage garage door will be closed and the subsequent space will be added to the guest cottage space highlighted in blue. The overall garage space will be reduced to only the double garage space. Um, 
And the next couple slides show the garage and guest cottage visibility from the public right of way. So here's the elevation that you saw earlier. This is kind of from an angle so you can kind of see the garage. Um, however, looking at the uh, rendering of the same uh, side, the front west elevation, um, you can't see the garage um, doors. Um, and this particular side that's facing you, highlighted in blue, um, is the side uh, connected to the uh, guest cottage or craft space. Um, and here is the uh, south elevation that you can slightly see the double car or two car garage um, peeking out. Um, and this elevation shows it a little bit clearer on the right there, highlighted in blue. Um, and then we've got the south elevation of the garage or accessory structure itself with the um, single car garage door um, being asked to be closed in um, and then the double car garage, two car garage remaining. So at the top, um, the elevation at the top is the existing um, garage. Um, so there is, in this elevation, there is a window and door. Um, in the original proposal um, in 2018, the window and door were approved on the accessory structure. However, after the permit was issued, the, window, the door and window were removed from the plans. Um, the single uh, car garage door is highlighted in blue, which will be closed, um, so only the double car garage remains. The smooth finished stucco material will be the same as the existing accessory structure, continuing the flat masonry wall. It is noted in the staff report that according to the visual compatibility standards, specifically the rhythm of solids to voids, the garage door is proposed to be walled in, creating a large expanse of the, on the blank wall. Because of this, a condition is added that the garage door proposed for removal be replaced with a window or door opening to ensure adequate rhythm of solids to voids along the accessory structure's south elevation. And then we've got um, the elevation of the garage from the north side where there's no visual changes and then the elevation of the garage from the east or rear side um, with also no visual changes. Oh, and that concludes my presentation. Okay, before we move into public comment, is there any ex parte communication? Same chart. None. Drive by. Drive by. None for me. Okay, is there any public comment? No? Okay. Any rebuttal or cross-examination from staff or from the applicant? If you guys could just state into the microphone oh. the no or... No. Yeah, none from staff. Okay. And Mr. Brito, do you have any cross-examination or rebuttal? You could come to the podium and just <laughs> let us know. Thank you. Uh, I don't see uh, nothing to add. Uh, the only thing is that uh, the door and the window that was on the first existing set of plans that we turned in, she eliminated those because she wanted the wall space for her art, art classes and art stuff that she does inside. So she needed the wall space. That's why we're closing off the door. So. All right. Thank you. Um, moving into board discussion, I think... Um, I think the applicant just answered my question. I was wondering why you already have an opening there. It seemed like it would be easier and cheaper probably to just put a pair of French doors in there and, and be done with it rather than block and stucco and, and uh, to build the wall. But um, I think it would look better if we had a window or doors or something in that opening instead of that blank wall well she has a uh, she has a, a planter box in front of the you just see the planter on the side with vines growing up the side there on one side where we eliminated the door uh, before in the window because basically what she wants is a wall space on the inside for shelves and storage space and she was looking more towards that rather than 
to look at at the other house from the garage. So. I think it's an I think it's an appropriate change, and um, it's totally this door that they're removing is totally hidden from the street view, yeah. um, as is the the whole building. So I I know I'm a stickler on windows and stuff, but on this one I'm going to leave it up to the board. I, I, I'm okay with it as presented, just in close. The, the garage, the we're, we're, we're actually in board discussion now, so unless they address a question to you, thank you. But then you've got you've created this little room here. It's got no no natural light or anything. He says the wall's coming down. Oh, the wall's coming down. Yeah, it's come this. Yeah, yeah the garage yeah. wall is coming down to give her studio mm -hmm. space. Jim, uh, I'm not. Sure, this is really within our realm to ask, but I'm assuming that the vehicle that's stored in there now is not going to be out in the front yard or something that will be sold. Uh, that was for, uh, supposed to be for a golf cart, and she never got one. Okay. Okay. And I just know that she garages, decided against it. Garages tend to get filled up, and the cars sit in <laughs> front yards. Um, I, I'm concerned about windows and doors. I, I understand your point about shelving space and displays and so forth, but that wall is just blank. Um, it does have planters on two thirds of it. Was that a decision that that once it was approved, that staff then had an administrative decision to not put it in? Is that yeah. Additional? Yeah. Let, let, let's ask Michelle that, that question. So. What, what it sounded like in, in Shelly Hewitt's presentation was that the plan was originally approved with a door and a window on this elevation and that was removed. And the question is, was it removed unilaterally by the homeowner or did that removal get approval? So we did do research to confirm what happened. Um, the permit was issued, the construction commenced, and then they came in and revised the plan to take the window and door out. And our research has indicated that did not get circulated back to our department, our division for review. So we didn't know that that happened until this application came in. But I do have one item of rebuttal to the applicant's rebuttal that I just wanna go on record for, for him and the owner. Um, this use on this property is approved for single family residential and I heard something about art classes happening on the property for which she would have to obtain the necessary approvals to do um, have a business on the site. It was technically approved as a garage and a guest cottage. Um, so if it's being utilized for something other than that, we need to kind of help her through that process and make sure that she's operating legally there. I don't believe, was this RO zoning, do you remember? Or RL? Can we check it on the map? Yeah. Um, if it's RL zoning, then um, business occupational licenses cannot be issued for, or sorry, business tax receipts cannot be issued for a business here. But it's possible she could have a home occupation and she would have to be in compliance with those requirements. It is RL. It's RL. So if it were RO, she could have a business license. RO. Okay, so it's RO. 100% Fifth Court. It's north of Fifth Terrace. It's RO. It's south of Fifth Terrace. Is it south of Fifth Terrace? Oh, then it's RL. RL. Yeah. So the staff report says RL. Yeah. So she would need to be in compliance with the requirements for occupational home occupation. So I just wanted to make that on the record and let Mr. Brito know so that he can inform his clients as well. Thank you. Would that be a condition? Um, no, it's a standard requirement of our code, so I don't think there's any necessary use condition that needs to be added. I, I'm going to flip positions with uh, Claudia here <laughs> and say that uh, the internal usages should not dictate the Correct. external uh, appearance. You're right. And there's certainly, I would think, would be ways to put windows or shades in and still have the shelves for display and, and, and uh, have it work just fine. 
Yeah, I agree 100 percent that um, th this particular use um, dictates the the need for a blank wall on the interior that creates a really a, a awkward appearance on the exterior. And even though it's not visible from the street, um, I still want to go back to our, our, our previous conversations with, with the previous applicant. It's like it's just. It's just not right, in my opinion, that, that I feel like I stand correct. that we would, I, I would rather see, um, you know, a, a large window, uh, you know, a little short wall and the window sitting on a sill or even a, a pair of French doors uh, coming directly off the, off the slab like you have in that other room so that um, you've got a little more normal looking rhythm of solids and voids and windows and doors and um, I, that's what I, I think I would like to see. It would be easier to do. I mean from a construction standpoint it, 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 it's hard harder to you know block and, and stucco and paint compared to and then it would never look right. You and Ron would do a great job but you'd still be able to see that what somebody blocked in that, that open in there? Not as cheap. Huh? It's not as cheap. And then you got, and make sure you get your glass right. Yeah. I agree. Standing to the if we're sticking to the standards, it's yeah. null and void. Yes, you're all right. Thank you're wall. correct. So we we agreeing that she can remove well, the. What's Let's, let's, I thought there was our, a condition. Yeah, I think there was a. Um, there, there is a condition. Yeah. Uh, but that doesn't address. That only addresses the area where the garage door is now. It doesn't address some of the things that you and Claudia brought up. So I, I have a little bit of um, heartburn over. The fact that those changes were made as a permit revision without the without coming through board. I mean that. But I think Michelle addressed that. In yeah, I, I I think what's before you right now is really the certificate of appropriateness relative to that garage door. So you really need to focus your um, discussion and efforts on on that area because I think as Michelle was saying she's um, I just tried to work out exactly where it went in the permit process but it's been it sounded like it was difficult to figure out if it went to another department or what happened there so um, if you can just stick to the confines of, of this specific request and view the fact this is such a simple thing really uh, is uh, can we ask for some fenestration, whatever, but have it administratively approved by Michelle? Yeah, I, I would be comfortable with that. And if it re reached a point where I was uncomfortable, I could bring it back to the board. So, you know, so we move it along so we don't have everything come back. No, I, and I think that um, the, the condition that sh is included in C actually gives that ability for her to make the decision window door opening a little bit of mm -hmm. leeway. And if she, like she said, if she feels uncomfortable, she can bring it back. The only thing I would ask if we're at that point um, is if you, you're looking for windows and doors and that those are actual openings and clarify if you would be okay with faux openings because I could see that potentially being an option that they might be looking at considering how they're trying to use the interior. The, um, the applicant is asking if he can speak on this issue. Yes, yeah. sure. Please do so. Basically, I kind of outspoke. She is not a class that she does. She just has some friends over and they do uh, arts and crafts in the room. She is not teaching or having a class or anything like that. Uh, basically, she wants the shelving for uh, storage space. And if you and if you look at, I don't know if you'd be in tune with. Uh, Go back the other oh, the, the other way. Yeah, you don't want to go oh, there. Bottom button. I'm sorry. <laughs> Keep 
the planner that she has right there, if we extended that planner in front of the two, in front of the existing garage door, because uh, right now, if there's a window or a door there, the only thing she's looking at is the house or the driveway. I don't see any really benefit to adding a door or a window there. She doesn't want it. And on the other end, on the uh, west side of the house, there's double doors and a window on the front. So there's plenty of light and there's plenty of air getting in there. So I'll show you on the f floor plan. Uh, there's two windows on the front of that and, a, and a, a French door right there leading into that room. So it's not a matter that she needs light in that room. There's plenty of light in the room. And as far as usage of the room, a door and a window, I don't know how that would be advantageous to anything. She's more concerned about storage and having a place to put stuff at than she is about uh, seeing anything uh, for her use. And th this is what you see from the street right there. You can't even see the door or the, the side of the building. You know, you get a glimpse of it maybe driving by in the, uh, right there. That's about what you see of the door and the window when you go by the house. So I have a question uh, for or the applicant, Ron, if um, I mean, I'm concerned about <clears throat> the appearance from the exterior, why couldn't she, why does she have to remove the door? Why couldn't you just keep the door that's there, build up your floor, hang drywall, insulate on the back side of it, make it go away from the inside, but leave the door on the outside? Keep it, keep I, it looking the same. She just doesn't, she just doesn't want the door there. <laughs> And, I, I, and it wouldn't, it, it's no extra effort to make it a solid wall or an indentation wall. I think the, the, uh, the, big, the best solution for look-wise on the outside is she has that planter and the vines going up the side. If we just extended that over in front of the existing wall and make it twice as big of one like that, it would look a little more appropriate. Uh, then a, a window or a door would not be needed. It would still, you'd still get the same look. You'd just be enhancing that side a little bit more with greenery. I, I personally think it looks better with the door gone. But, I mean, yeah. Michelle had a good point. We could ask for a faux window to break up that wall if you want. Uh, or, or a real window, what, what, whatever. But I'm not sure it needs a door and a window. How about uh, a full window plus the plantings come across? I mean, I don't know what the purpose of a sir, full. Sir, and, unless he's directing his question to that to you, um, sir, in board discussion. Thank you. But if you are, Mr. Chard, feel free to <laughs> direct that way. <laughs> Well, obviously, the purpose of a faux window would not be to let light in, uh, and it would certainly allow shelving on the other side. But it would, uh, it would probably comply more with you know, our our guidelines uh, than just a blank wall. Can I speak? Are you asking yes. a question yes. to him? Yeah, please do. Well, a full window would just be an indentation in the in the wall, and I don't know what the purpose of that would be or the use of it. I think it would be uh, uh, it would be more appropriate for the planter box to be extended down further, and that trellis uh, part of it extended down further. It would look a lot nicer with uh, with the greenery in front of that, and it would break that wall up. Uh, completely and give it a lot, make it look a lot nicer with the greenery, I think, than it would be with an indentation in a faux window or something there. Yes, that means a real window. I was actually suggesting both, but I, I hear your point. Technically, we're not supposed to use landscape plannings to hide 
uh, conditions that uh, that we feel don't apply. But um, you know, why not a window on that wall somewhere to break it to break it up? I, I'm not saying window and door, but I mean. A, a faux window seems like just as much work to me as a win as a regular window, but I, I, I'm not here to to tell you how to do it. I just I feel like the board would like to see that wall broken up with something besides landscaping material. Myself, I think you have a big two car garage opening on that whole side of the house. I mean. That, that should be enough of an opening on, on a wall that's, uh, say, half of the wall is garage door. I'm seeing a one-car garage door, but um, I think we've... It's a 12-foot it's it's uh, door. I, there, there, he's not directing a question okay. to you at this point. That, that is a two-car garage and then the golf cart. It is. The, the bay is 12 feet wide, the golf cart is nine foot eight on the plan I think it showed that, that was a two car garage one car ten foot twelve oh, yeah that is one car wow okay I'm corrected it's a single car garage and yeah. then a small it's golf a, car garage it's a twelve foot opening Somebody needs to make a motion. Somebody needs to make a motion. Back to the motion motion slide. Oh sure. Yeah, I'd make a motion that um, we move or that we approve Certificate of Appropriateness 2021-267 for the property located at 201 Northeast 5th Court, Delida Park Historic District by finding that the request and approval thereof is consistent with the comprehensive plan and meets the criteria set forth in the land development regulations subject to the following conditions. That the garage door proposed for removal be replaced with a window or door opening to ensure adequate rhythm of solids to voids along the south elevation of the accessory structure. Can I add that Michelle Hoyland can approve that? It wouldn't have to come back before the board. That's fine. Second. Okay. Jeff? Call the roll. Jim Charn? Yes. Claudia Willis? Yes. Kristen Finn? Yes. Benjamin Baffer? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Brito. What is the condition? The condition it's that as it is in the staff report. It has to have okay. a Okay. Yeah. Okay. We'll send you a letter with screen. Where are we now? Okay. Thanks. Yes. We are legislative. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Michelle. You did a great job on your first presentation. Nice work. Oh, well, let me give you this. I was betting on an eight o'clock end time for this meeting. <laughs> Told you not to bet. I know. <laughs> I, I was just guesstimating, but. Um, so oh, we are what? A, are we shorter. Reports and comments now. No legislative items. Reports and comments by staff. Our next meeting is December 1st, 2021. Um, the last board meeting, the board asked me about a sign in the Marina Historic District, which I have engaged with code enforcement on, and we will coordinate um, with the property owner what has to happen next. Um, I honestly am, don't remember everything that we went over last time, but I have been looking into the things you've asked for. Um, I know there was some discussion 
about landscape standards at our last meeting um, that was brought to the board and I understand that Mr. Chard is going to want to speak about that next month. Um, so if you all can remember the, I think we emailed you the info and he also printed it to you, so gave it to you. So please review that and be prepared to under, um, at the end of the agenda, have a, a discussion about that item. Okay, and may I ask a question? Yes. So in respect to that, since Jim had does reference the tree canopy study can the board be given an issue of the city's tree canopy study um in in a link so they could be better prepared uh you all can you're asking if you all can research that or are you asking me to, what are you asking uh, well i i was asking you to share the link just because i didn't know uh, uh that that Robert or other people had seen the tree canopy survey and I knew that that was very important in driving behind Jim's discussion. So I thought if they could just see the city initiated study. Yes, I can share that with the board. Okay, and on top of that, <laughs> I also did send you some references from the Secretary of Interior Standards on setting and building sites, which ref references all the landscaping with no comment from me. I wondered if that could be shared. Yes, and I have one thing I want to give to you. Hold on one second. Okay. I might not have sent you a good, clean copy. I'll try again. Yes, it's a crummy pen. Yeah. Um, so it, every time a new board member joins the board, we have been um, putting together a training binder for that board member, and Mr. Char did not get his. Did everyone else get theirs? Mm -hmm. I, believe I, I got mine. It's, it's good. Everyone. The one I wasn't sure about was So the reason why I'm bringing this up under that discussion is inside, um, Michelle, did we do a flash drive as well with all the documents? No. Um, we'll get you a flash drive as well, Mr. Chard, but they're, the standards that you're talking about is a the big book that I refer to all the time. And... Um, that is in the rehabilitation section, so I was going to suggest that the board member, board members could go on their own with the link or the flash drive to look at that document. Because okay. it's so big, um, I would just be emailing a link, but I can certainly send the link again and the page number where that's at. There are specific standards about site and setting. I have a separate question also, yeah. and this is in reference to historic designation of properties, as which I see is one of our duties to contemplate as a board. Um, so I was looking at the designation application, and I noticed that we have the right to uh, to try to bring up something for designation, but the first thing I noticed was owner consent. So it has to be owner owner driven basically um i mean we've i have had discussions with my clg partners which are all of the other communities in the state of florida and what are they doing how is this being handled do we need to make adjustments to our code or anything like that um everyone has an owner consent requirement so even if the board brought something up that they were interested in seeing designated you it's going to stop at the owner so that's how our ordinance is okay i think it's um coral gables that and some other there's a couple other cities that have some more stringent requirements palm beach too uh, we just simply don't have those requirements in our code okay well they, our hands they do tend then. to lead yeah. to litigation when the board engages a project like that that's it for me I, I know I've asked you this before, but I want to ask you one more time. Is there any chance on this discussion with regard to preservation of uh, natural environment, which, which is what I'm calling it, as opposed to the built environment, that we could do it under presentations rather than at the end of these uh, considerations of complicated issues, 
when we're tired and hungry and so forth. So I, I think you can move for consensus to put it on the agenda that way. However, typically, um, the reason that we do not do that is so that, you know, you make sure that you're getting the applications through and, you know, the people who are paying to have their applications reviewed and looked at by you guys, they make sure that they get there so that you're not reaching that cutoff. So, but you could, you could seek consensus from the board to put that on the agenda that way. I agree. Unless we have an agenda at some point with very few items, but I don't see that happening, right? You, you, you so we already know it. next month is 212 Seabreeze, the Paul Rudolph House, and 110 Marine Way. And it's possible for a third COA to be on, depending on if we get a submittal by Friday. Um, so that's three items. And the Paul Rudolph is probably going to be a big, that's going to be a big item. Probably garner a lot of discussion. And I think we would be at a similar time frame than we, as we are tonight, just based off of what we did tonight and those two projects are similar in a way. The, the other thought is, could we do trees environment um, as a, like a workshop on a non, non meeting? So time? we have very specific direction on how workshops get scheduled and I would need to discuss that up the chain from um, our director of development services and to the city manager's office because myself and the board do not have the authority to schedule workshops but you could certainly request one and i could talk with them to see if that would be something that um, we could proceed with i, I just feel like we're going to you know I, this is something we want as a board we want to discuss and we want to understand and learn but i just have this feeling it'll we'll never get to it right because we just like you said, it gets 10 o'clock and nobody wants to right. talk about anything at that point. Yeah. I do think it's important to talk about our role in preservation with the, with the site and the setting. And I still would like to campaign for input on landscape plans um, that are presented to us. Um, well, the landscape plans aren't presented, but I feel like we should have input on that. And that would definitely be a topic you could discuss at that time, whether it's a board meeting yes. or a workshop, because that would require a code amendment. Kelly and I did look at that before the meeting tonight. Um, the purview is very specific that this board does not review uh, landscape plans for single family and duplex, I think it was. So that, that would be an item, a line item to add to your future discussion, how you wanna handle that. Well, I think it, it definitely fits together, you know, and, and the landscape consideration would fit under that, that context. But you're saying that in order for this board to have a workshop, we have to get approvals from the city manager? Yes, we don't set the workshop schedule. That's set at a different level, um, unlike commission. So with the bylaws that were established for these boards, the, the, only, um, the only workshops are established established by city manager or designee and that one workshop related to um, like legal training. So like she said, I mean, you could recommend, um, make a motion to recommend it to this um, city manager and see if they're able to set that. It's really like a scheduling thing and a lot of, a lot goes into that for staff. So it's making sure that, you know, chain of command is fo followed as far as staff time and resources. And I think the option that Ms. Brandon offered, which was if the board had consensus to move this to the front of the agenda, so it's presentations, that could be an option as well, where we could, we could put some things together so that you could see like the screenshots of the sections you're talking about, where in the code it says about the single family being reviewed only by permit, and put some of that together to get you started on the discussion. So you could do that through a consensus if you wanted to do that now. I, I think the idea of a workshop is really good because we don't run into the problems that Kelly talked about of denying people who've paid fees their fair time. And 
we wouldn't necessarily be rushed. We wouldn't have to try to squeeze it into 15 minutes or something. Or another option is you could do consensus to start, and I know this might be hard for you, Ben, but you could do consensus to start the meeting an hour earlier so that your presentation time is happening from five to six with a time stop at six to start moving on to the applicants. That would give you an hour. Can you come in? Yeah. He, he's the boss, yeah. but he's the boss. <laughs> Ben, can you at least come a half an hour? I say that to my husband all the time. Yeah. You're the boss. You're the boss. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 could, when you want. I could do that, uh, or I could, I could work from home that day. Yeah. yeah. presentations and have an earlier start time yeah. and if we find that's insufficient time we can do it again do it again or think about a workshop mm -hmm. yeah, I like that idea one, one of the things that it, especially if we if we start going down the route of uh, the to, a, a code amendment to put landscape review part of our purview then there's going to have to be a whole educational component to that too, because mm -hmm. you know we have we have the Secretary of Interior's guidelines to help us with the, the the built environment, but the unbuilt environment isn't as well. Uh, we're, we're not as well versed in that. And, right. and, you, know, you have Florida statutes too. Well, it's I, I, a whole I, thing that we've had to get educated on as staff how that works because single family property owners do have certain allowances that they're allowed to do. Kelly is well versed in this. She's advised um, in our code and what the historic preservation, the, the tree ordinance says, but for a homeowner, if they want to take a tree out, they can, they have to provide an Arbus report or you said a certified or an yeah, engineer. Certified Arbus report. But there's also a lot it of It could be a landscape engineer as well. Yeah. There's a lot of considerations for you know native plants and mm -hmm. and you know species. Well, oh, and, and we got Frank to keep a tree tonight. Yeah. Or mm -hmm. so, as uh, maybe. <laughs> I mean, we we do discuss those things, and we discuss you know I mean the Secretary of Interior standards talk about not putting uh, parking too close to damaged landscape or or trees or the house or I mean so we do cross over a little bit and I'm wondering what power we really have to say oh we don't want you to cut down that tree I mean there's certainly requirements in the code that exist and to educate the board on what they are and us as well because we've had to learn ourselves um, but there's also comprehensive plan policies that are in the historic element which talks about things as we move forward that we are planning to do anyway, so it would be a good time to have a conversation about what those things are and include it into this. I, I would say that in general, most trees are in residential areas. The commercial areas have parking lots and big buildings and very few trees. So if we overlook the residential component of a, of a community, we are really overlooking the opportunity to save and build up our canopy. I think it's a very fair point. So Jim's doing a presentation. I, if you guys, delighted. if you guys want to, if you guys have consensus for him to do a, a discussion item, or a, I think we could put it as a discussion item. That way, if you guys want to recommend anything, you can, um, and uh, and it could be moved to the front of the agenda for. A five or five thirty or something, because um, because no quasi judicial items can be. Um, oh, actually, never mind. I'm sorry. Just kidding. It's five o'clock, five o one. So, but you know, you would normally start at six. So I think you still are taking into consideration the applicants. Do you have documents up there? Does it say what? Do we have a required start time of six, or does it just say the in the evening? Let me pull the bylaws. 
Because I know for Sprab it's in the evening or maybe it's after five or something because they were starting at yeah, 501. Yeah, that's what it says, I think. But... So I wouldn't want to go this whole way and then find out we can't start yeah. at five. Good. Good thought. Is it in the LDRs or the bylaws? But it was in our bylaws. Um... While you're doing that, uh, among the other subordinate issues, you raised, I use that word purposefully, subordinate, um, that been raised is, is one is this wouldn't necessarily be in historic preservation areas. If we are trying to preserve the built environment, it almost by definition is not in a historic preservation area. So just throw that in too. Yeah, I think what you're looking at is the preservation of trees, not necessarily trees in a historic district. I would broaden it beyond trees, an ecosystem. Yeah, I think you, you you know what I'm saying is yeah. it's not a historic yeah. district topic. It's a what it sounds like you're saying is it's a broader topic and it, it may be. I'm just Ben raised a couple of complicating issues that we need to consider. And I'm just adding to that list. Sure. Well, aren't we writing a new tree ordinance now? I mean, is <laughs> I, I honestly don't know the answer to that question. Well, because, you know, I have campaigned, and I've campaigned the Preservation Trust on this, to, to make mm. a category of historic trees, historic contributing trees that, that we should have purview over. But, I mean, until they actually do that at the city level, I don't think we can deem something historic, a tree historic. Like I said, there is a policy in the comp plan that's talking, I believe it, we may have referred to it as legacy trees, I don't remember, or historic landscapes or something like that. So you have a lot to discuss. There's a lot there to look at. This may not be one meeting done and then move on. You may want to look at these things and talk about it again and after you digest, because it's a lot of information. So unfortunately, it actually does say it will commence at 6 p.m. So unless it's approved by the city manager, it's the city manager's designee. So again, that would just have to be a recommendation to the city manager that you start at five, five and for this meeting. And it just needs to be advertised accordingly. Um, so we'll bring it up with our director and Lynn. Yeah, if Kelly you guys do you have consensus, I, I think I've seen all of you shake your yeah. head yes. And yeah. is that for next yes. next yes. meeting? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, next meeting we have six ten possibly coming back North Ocean. Yeah. It's just uh, starting. Oh, starting at five. five. five for the present, to get and presentations. Oh, okay, I can do that. I can do that. Yeah, I, I would suspect we would do that and then realize that we're going to have to start at five the next meeting to finish up what <laughs> we didn't. I would imagine so. Because you know, and and it, it, I think uh, even going forward, you know, we we want to talk about the the natural environment. Um, we've already had presentations on uh, flood proofing and and things like that. Um, but you know, there there's other other like flood proofing that that I always think about that we haven't really addressed, and that's sustainability in, mm -hmm. in history. Mm -hmm. Um, That's a great point. There is an entire Secretary of the Interior Standards Guidelines book on sustainability as well. There's an entire book. I found some quotes. There was a section, I thought. There's a whole separate guideline book on oh, sustainability. Maybe we need that link. Yeah. <laughs> well, and because I just remember that that's come up now with, with um, commission and, and code uh, amendment right for the the sustainability or for the green buildings on uh, commercial buildings and um, residents over 5,000 but the historic designated properties or historic districts are kind of exempt from that so yeah pretty much we, we need to really um, understand what what we should be yeah. doing about sustainability yeah I'm I'm making a list of links and things that I can share and helping to prepare you for this meeting um, the sustainability guidelines the tree survey study the historic preservation policies the sections on the tree ordinance 
which is 4, 6, 19. And 4, 6, 16 is the landscape code. What else? Did I miss anything? Would it um, make any sense to take a look at another city that is noted for its percent canopy coverage? See what it is that they have that makes that happen? Like, I feel like that's your subsequent meeting. I feel like that's in the tree canopy study. It might be, but I feel like you've got an hour that we're trying to do this in. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we're just putting a list together now. Um, for the, which for list? The second meeting. I'm going to put also in oh. here the LDR section that states your purview. Oh, so brain dead by the end of the night. I mean, as you start moving through this, if you're going to go to the point where you're making some kind of ask of the commission that says, hey, we'd like you to investigate this and maybe change the code, you're probably going to have to have a second one of these meetings so you can further review what you want to say to them. Yeah, and we if, could start broad and then narrow down to yeah. specific things. But I, I think when we start looking at code amendments, as I've worked through this in different processes like the historic preservation task force when the city man or the city commission put that together then we started analyzing other cities codes with that steering committee okay i'm not trying to say no i'm just trying to make sure we can achieve what you want in the first you know, I, i'm just saying that we aren't the first city to think about this and you right. are those that are leading us i agree I wrote it down, though. Okay. What else? Other topics? Questions? Adjourn. Adjourn? Oh. See everybody in <laughs> December Thank 1st, you all. maybe at 5 p.m. <laughs> we get permission. If we get permission. I guess, I hope we have better attendance next time. Well, the, the uh, problem is with the continuation, we're going to have to, the rest of the, well, the rest Rhonda of the board is going to have to miss is another meeting. She's on. I don't think you can miss, uh, can you miss three in a row? Three in a row, you know. Yeah, not three in a row. Is it three in a year or is it three in a row? Huh? Three total. And she's already missed two. I think she's been avoiding Frank. And, she, and, and he's, he's coming back next week. Whenever he's on the agenda, she doesn't.